The nation's top infectious disease expert says he will warn the Senate that reopening the economy too fast could cause needless suffering and death. Anthony Fauci will appear this morning before the Senate Health, Education, Labor and Pensions Committee, along with three other U.S. health officials. You can see the hearing room set up for social distancing, a symbol of this historic time. This is live coverage from the Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey, joining you from the Washington Post newsroom. Today's hearing is scheduled to start at 10 o'clock Eastern time. It's Dr. Fauci's first time appearing before Congress since President Trump declared a national emergency back in March. Also testifying, the heads of the CDC and the FDA and the federal official who co oversees the coronavirus testing ex efforts. Well, joining me today to talk about the hearing, Yasmin Abutaleb, National Health Policy Reporter. Yasmin, it's so good of you to be with us um, from your home since we're practicing social distancing. What is so key about today's hearing, Yasmin? Well, this is the first time that we've seen the health officials testify on the response since March. And it actually comes at kind of an interesting time. You know, the hearing today is supposed to be about reopening the country. Senators are supposed to have a chance to ask about how to safely reopen and whether the U.S. is ready to go back to work. And, you know, sort of ironically, most of the key members can't actually be there in person today because they have to quarantine because they came into contact uh, with confirmed cases. You know, Dr. Fauci, uh, Dr. Hahn, the FDA commissioner, Dr. Redfield, the CDC director, um, and, and, Brett, and Dr. Joa from HHS, you know, they are all, um, or not Dr. Joao, but the other three are all quarantining at home right now because they came into contact with Vice President Pence's press secretary who um, tested positive for coronavirus last week. So, you know, there have been questions about if the White House, with all its resources, with rapid testing and regular testing, can't keep cases out of the building, then, you know, how can Americans feel safe going back to workplaces that will likely have much fewer resources? Um, and Lamar Alexander, the committee chairman, is also uh, conducting the hearing virtually because um, one of his staff members tested positive. So he's, you know, conducting it remotely from his home. Mm. You know, I'm glad you brought up the irony of the, that, Yasmin. The title of this hearing is Safely Getting Back to Work and Back to School. And it is important to point out this is a Republican-led committee, although Democrats and Republicans will both get a chance to ask questions. I want to turn to our colleague Rhonda Colvin, who is live on Capitol Hill. And uh, Rhonda, it's your first time being there in such a long time. It's so good to see you in person. Um, what can you tell us about the unusual logistics of today's hearing? And good to hear you too as well, Libby. Uh, in terms of logistics, what we're hearing right now is the first six people that you're going to see are actually going to be participating in this hearing remotely. That includes, of course, the chairman, Lamar Alexander. He's going to be doing this from home. And I'm also hearing from a committee aide that Senator Murray, she's the ranking member from uh, Washington State. She also may be doing this virtually as well. And then you're going to have the four witnesses today, including Dr. Fauci, all giving uh, their statements virtually today. So this certainly is a different landscape. Uh, on the hill. It's sort of a part of a new normal. When you get a, a shot of the room, you're going to see that the, the chairs are going to be separated so that they are six feet apart. Members of the public are not going to be able to attend this. Uh, members can, of the public cannot uh, be on the hill right now anyways. Uh, but this committee uh, will be far different from what we are used to. I'm also hearing that some of the senators who are on this committee, there are 23 in total, uh, some of them may also be attending virtually. And there will be uh, TV monitors as well in that room so that they can participate and see those participating virtually. So uh, part of the, the normalcy that you will see is uh, there will be a five-minute round of questioning for each of the senators to ask Dr. Fauci and others the questions that they have on their mind regarding uh, the economy and testing and vaccines. So that's going to be a part of uh, a normal hearing. But the rest of it, it's certainly new and it's certainly historic. Rhonda, what are you going to be listening for today? I'm going to be listening to uh, about hearing more about testing. We know that when Dr. Fauci was here uh, two months ago in March in front of the House Oversight Committee, testing was a big issue then. And even though things are a lot different right now, it's still a big issue. And this committee has sort of been uh, the center point for discussions of testing on the Hill. Uh, Lamar Alexander has uh, pitched the idea of having a Shark Tank uh, style approach to getting more testing in the United States. He's held hearings where uh, NIH uh, experts and other health experts 
experts and tech experts have been coming to propose ideas they have to ramp up testing. It's been a key issue. He said that it's crucial to starting the economy again. It's crucial to getting people comfortable going into their jobs again and for schools to open up. So he will likely definitely focus on testing. And uh, Senator Murray, the Democratic ranking member, she too has been talking about testing in this committee way back in March. And she's from Washington State, which we know is one of the early hard hit states. So she definitely is also going to be focusing on testing. So I think that's going to be key here. Of course, we heard the president yesterday saying that when it comes to testing, we've prevailed, but you're probably going to hear uh, some contradictions to that today. Uh, Rhonda, I'd love to hear more about the dynamics on this committee. You mentioned the two top members. Uh, this is a Republican-led committee, um, and Dr. Fauci at first didn't want to testify. Or really, rather, the White House was not going to let him testify before the House. He is appearing before this committee. What dynamics will you be watching for? Yeah, this isn't a committee that we have typically covered, but it is a, a pretty notable committee and historically usually has big names on it. Hillary Clinton served on this committee. Barack Obama served on this committee. John McCain served on this committee. And uh, right now there are still big names. Mitt Romney on the Republican side, uh, Rand Paul, uh, Bernie Sanders is on this committee, Elizabeth Warren. So you're definitely going to uh, see some uh, household names today. And a lot of them have been introducing their own legislation when it comes to coronavirus. So I would expect that there uh, will not be a lack of uh, of questions, hard-hitting questions perhaps, to Dr. Fauci and the others from these members. All right, Rhonda Colvin on Capitol Hill. We'll check in with you in just a little bit. Now let's go to James Homan, national political reporter and author of The Daily 202, uh, joining us remotely. Um, James, so good to see you as well as Yasmin. Um, why are we seeing this committee talk to these experts today? Um, both the timing, James, and also the makeup of who's coming and who will be asking the questions. Well, so the committee is chaired by Lamar Alexander, who has had a good relationship with the administration, but has also been tough. He's a retiring Republican senator from Tennessee. He's appearing remotely because he has uh, self-quarantined because one of his own staff got it. Uh, the Senate usually gets first dibs on high-profile hearings like this. It's just the way it typically works. But it's especially true in this case because the administration doesn't want witnesses appearing before Democrats when they appear before a Republican controlled Senate committee, the Trump team can exert a lot more control over the ground rules uh, for how long people can ask, whether they can have follow up rounds of questioning. And so the uh, the Senate Health Committee proved much more amenable than the, the House committees, which, you know, the president has not forgotten impeached him last year. And the reason we're hearing from this mix of witnesses is these are the people who are really the most involved with the effort, but they're also in kind of a, a appointed position. So we're not hearing from Deborah Burks today uh, because she's not in a kind of an official role. She's been appointed as the, the leader of the task force, but uh, the head of the CDC, the head of the FDA, and then the uh, Tony Fauci, uh, who's been in his job since 1984. It's a, a nonpartisan, nonpolitical job, uh, but he, all three are in kind of official appointments. And so it's uh, much easier for Congress to summon them. Uh, Congress controls the budgets for all three agencies. So all three of these these gentlemen, uh, plus the uh, the testing side, but which is the kind of the big question that Republicans have had uh, as well as Democrats. So that's that's sort of how we ended up with the mix of those four. Because, I mean, you know, hearings are often a mix of a real search for answers as well as a show of politics, right? Some political grandstanding, whether you support the administration, whether you're um, criticizing the administration. What will you be listening for in terms of substance today and the committee members trying to get answers from these witnesses? Well, I think a lot of people especially are eager to hear from Dr. Fauci, who, you know, is known um, to not pull punches, to be honest. He's, he's been publicly critical of the administration's response before, which, you know, sometimes has, has put him in hot water. Um, you know, there's, there's been a lot of sort of vitriol towards him uh, for his seeming contradicting the president about how the response has been going at different points. So I think a lot of members are going to be looking for a fairly blunt and honest assessment from him about how things have been going. I think, like you mentioned earlier, there are going to be a lot of questions about testing. Uh, the president and, and several members of his administration yesterday um, held a news conference where they sort of heralded how far the country's come on testing and said, the U.S. was leading the world in testing. They put up a bunch of charts and metrics, you know, trying to show how great the U.S. is doing on 
on testing because it's it's from the beginning been a, a storyline that's been very difficult for the administration and, and clouded their response. Um, and I think there's no doubt that the administration has greatly improved its testing capacity, but I think the problem is that they're always, you know, behind the curve. There are a lot of questions now about even though the U.S. has now has the ability to test about 300,000 people a day, um, you know, whether that's enough to, to get people back to work. The general consensus is it's not. Um, I think there are going to be questions about, you know, if, if the White House is having cases with, with all the precautions they're taking, the tests they have available, um, and, and members still need to isolate, and, and there are still, you know, cases popping up. Trump's personal valet um, also tested positive. Then why should Americans feel safe going back to work? And, you know, Dr. Fauci's testimony, uh, comments, of the parts that have gotten out, um, I think there are going to be questions as to whether they feel that some states are reopening too quickly and whether the country really isn't ready to reopen. Um, and I think there are going to be a lot of questions about what the plan is. If there, if we see a surge in cases in a specific area? What's the role of the federal government? What's the role of the White House? Um, you know, are they doing anything to prepare for another wave of cases in the fall or even in the summer with some of these states prematurely open? So um, there will, I'm sure there will be some political grandstanding. You know, Democrats haven't held back in criticizing the administration's response. Uh, but I think there are legitimate questions about what the role of the White House and the federal government is moving forward on the reopening, how you do it. There's still, you know, not a ton of clarity on, on, on what the plan is and, and how you're going to rapidly ramp up testing capacity to get people back to work. So I think all those substantive questions will arise as well as, you know, sound bites like you would see in any hearing. Mm. James, your Daily 202 today has this headline, the governors who raced to relax coronavirus restrictions pay a price in a new poll. So you're reporting on and watching just how the nation's governors and mayors are making decisions, you know, this whole hearing is about reopening. And there are so many questions about how the federal guidelines just don't match up to what some governors, especially Republican governors, are choosing to do. Um, where do the senators fall in to this question of how quickly their governors should be deciding to move forward? Yeah, Libby, the, a lot of the, the, our new poll, we've been doing weekly polling, and this one is a large national poll and it shows overwhelmingly Americans still think it's too soon to ease a lot of these restrictions. And the partisan breakdown is almost exactly even, like 50% think that the top priority should be public health, even if that means more closures, and 49% believe that the priority should be reopening businesses. I think that that's about where you see the breakdown in the Republican conference on the Senate side. I think someone like Lamar Alexander uh, is going to err more on the side of public health. and then. You have uh, some senators who I think are much more kind of raring to go. I think you'd see that even more among conservatives on the House side uh, than the Senate side. And so there's definitely more tension in our poll. More than 90 percent of Democrats believe that the closures should continue. And the, the party has been pretty united on that. But for the most part, Americans, our polling shows are following the cues of people like Anthony Fauci. Our national poll last week showed that his uh, favorability rating was over 70% nationally. And people trust people like Tony Fauci far more than Donald Trump when it comes to public health. And I think one of the things you'll see Fauci do when he testifies is say the Trump administration's guidelines, the administration's guidelines are this and governors aren't following the president's guidelines. Even though as we know, the president has sort of cheered a lot of these governors as they have ignored his own official guidelines that he unveiled to great fanfare. And so I, I think, you know, Fauci has been willing to, to say things that put him at odds with the administration, especially early on. He gave interviews that annoyed a lot of people in the White House, but he also is diplomatic. That's how he's had his job since 1984. And I think you'll see him couch a lot of his views as a public health expert as being the position of the administration, even if he knows inside that the president doesn't totally agree with that. Well, one of those examples of Dr. Fauci pushing back and then trying to sort of uh, be uh, politically savvy in his response happened just a month ago. This was over Easter weekend when Dr. Fauci gave an interview to Jake Tapper on CNN. And the comments that he made got a lot of pushback uh, from Trump supporters. In fact, many Trump supporters called for a Fire Fauci campaign. Trump himself even retweeted Fire Fauci. Let's listen to what Dr. Fauci said that was so controversial. Obviously, you could logically say that if you had a process that was ongoing and you started mitigation earlier, you could have saved lives. Obviously, no one is going to deny that. 
But what goes into those kinds of decisions is, is complicated. But you're right. I mean, obviously, if we had right from the very beginning shut everything down, it may have been a little bit different. But there was a lot of pushback about shutting things down back then. Now, just one day later, Fauci attempted to retract or at least clarify his remarks. This was at the White House coronavirus briefing. Let's listen. I had uh, an interview yesterday that I was asked a, a hypothetical question. Uh, and hypothetical questions sometimes can get you into some difficulty because it's what would have or could have. The first and only time that Dr. Burks and I went in and formally made a recommendation to the president to actually have a, quote, shutdown in the sense of not really shutdown, but to really have strong mitigation. We discussed it. Obviously, there would be concern by some that, in fact, that might have some negative consequences. Nonetheless, the president listened to the recommendation and went to the mitigation. Dr. Fauci, just one month ago, let's go to Yasmin uh, to, to give us some sense of this tightrope that Dr. Fauci and others in the administration are having to walk, Yasmin. Why was there a real pushback from Trump's supporters? I mean, Dr. Fauci is just talking about the timeline and saving lives and, and, and you know, looking back at, at when decisions were made. Why was that so touchy? I think, you know, this president is extremely sensitive and any sort of looking back or saying we could have done this differently or we could have done that differently is viewed as a direct criticism of the president. You know, obviously the president had a lot of public statements, tweets, you know, downplaying the threat of coronavirus, uh, praising the, the Chinese president, uh, President Xi for his response, even though uh, we know that officials at the time were telling him to take a tougher line um, and warning that China was withholding information about, you know, the breadth of the outbreak and just how severe it was. Now he's sort of turned and is blaming China for the outbreak and is sort of, um, you know, tried to deny that he made any comments downplaying the threat of the coronavirus. He regularly points to um, imposing a travel ban with China at the end of January as, as, as a signal that he was taking this very seriously. But I think the public statements speak for themselves. And I think because of that, the president and many members of his administration are very sensitive to any sort of implication that they didn't take this seriously or they didn't act quick enough. So Dr. Fauci's comments, you know, while, you know, maybe to someone else are viewed as just sort of like, yeah, you know, mitigation, if we had done it earlier, we would have saved more lives. That seems like common sense. I think the president and many of his supporters took that as a direct criticism of, of of President Trump and, and a signal that he didn't act quick enough or that he didn't listen to recommendations that he imposed social distancing fast enough, um, which I think is why you saw Dr. Fauci come out to the press briefing the following day and say, oh, he always listened to us. You know, we were never ignored. Maybe some people had concerns, but not the president. And you've seen him do that to other health officials who he feels are not sort of staying on the message that he wants them to stay on. You know, you've seen him do it to Dr. Redfield when he spoke to our colleague, Lena Sun, for, for an interview with The Post and said that an outbreak of the virus in the fall could be much worse than what we're experiencing now. You know, he was sort of trotted out to the briefing the next day and had to, had to sort of clarify his statements, but he also said he was quoted accurately. I mean, you've seen this happen with a number of health officials at this point who I think often are just trying to speak to the public health side of things, you know, whether it's saying we could have done this differently or maybe this could have been better. But, you know, this is not uh, an administration that, that takes very kindly to that. Um, and, you know, there's there's been, we know, and we've reported several times, there's been a huge focus on messaging and public relations and, um, you know, public relations crisis response um, in, in this pandemic, as well as the public health response. Mm. Yes, I mean, I'm so glad you brought up Dr. Redfield, because, of course, we're not only going to hear from Dr. Fauci, we'll hear from other witnesses as well. Um, yes, I mean, what else should we be listening for when Dr. Hahn from the FDA testifies or Dr. Brett Jawa, who's become now a face of these briefings that the White House is doing. Well, you know, I think there are um, a number of questions across these different agencies. Dr. Jawa is the, is the testing czar for the administration, so I'm sure many of the testing questions are going to be directed to him. Um, Dr. Redfield, you know, the CDC hasn't held a briefing since March 9th. Um, I think there are going to be some questions about whether the CDC has been muzzled, um, you know, how they're going to make sure public health information gets out to people who need it right now. Um, you know, states and indi individuals are looking for guidance about how to reopen, when it's safe to start going out, when can people start are, you know, sort of resuming a, a bit more of their of their normal lives. What does the new normal look like? You know, I think there are going to be a lot of questions about that. I think for Dr. Han, the FDA commissioner, there's been um, 
you know, you've seen a, a, a number of, of members of Congress um, put out statements and warnings and, and criticisms of how the FDA has handled these antibody tests, which can um, test people's blood to see if they've had the virus and have developed some sort of immunity to it. A lot of bad tests have made it out to the market because uh, they don't need to get FDA approval. A number of members have called on the FDA to, to more stringently regulate these tests, so I'm sure he'll get some questions about that. He'll get some questions about, you know, a vaccine, therapeutics for the fall, if the fall is worse than what we're experiencing now. So, I mean, there are, it's, it's not just Dr. Fauci. There are a number of health concerns that I think members are going to have about how we move forward. You know, we never really had a decline in cases. We've just sort of plateaued, uh, which I think has raised a lot of concerns. And because of that, there are a lot of questions about medical countermeasures, how we move forward, what's safe, what's not. And, and all these all these health officials are equipped to answer different parts of that. Mm. James, if you were a senator on this committee, what would you be asking of these witnesses testifying? Yeah, I think what Yasmin was just looking at is absolutely right. She mentioned the plateau. Uh, a report leaked out from the White House last night that kind of identified a bunch of areas where we're seeing spikes. And some of those areas are in states that these senators represent. If you take the New York numbers out of the, uh, you know, the the kind of the national figures, uh, we're seeing increases in a lot of places. My home state of Minnesota has seen a big uh, increase week over week. Our neighboring state of Maryland has, and so I think the the senators from some of those places are going to be very keyed in on what their governor should be doing. Uh, I do think you'll see some point scoring, but I think that. Democrats will try hard not to look like they're just scoring points for the sake of scoring points because, you know, someone like, you know, these are doctors and medical professionals who are held in high regard. These aren't uh, administration, you know, kind of officials as we, we think of them. And so that I think will make the tone a lot more respectful. Uh, you know, if I was a senator, I'd, I'd be worried about the big industries in my state. I mean, this is this is the biggest public health crisis since 1918. This is the biggest economic crisis since 1933. And no one is spared. The jobs report last week showed, you know, white collar professionals are, are getting hammered. Uh, we have a story today about the toll it's taking on farmers. There's a lot of uh, people who represent heavily rural agricultural states on this committee. Uh, and, you know, th they're gonna be concerned about trying to um, you know, their states. And, and so I think you'll, you'll see a lot of, of that kind of localism and uh, parochialism in, in some ways. Well, this hearing is scheduled to get underway in under 10 minutes, and we'll bring that to you live and uninterrupted. Um, we talked about how the witnesses will be appearing remotely, as well as some committee members, including the chairman. Our colleague Rhonda Colvin is on Capitol Hill. And, and Rhonda, you know, I'd love to hear from you how different this moment is and how this new normal is impacting what you're seeing and feeling this morning on the Hill. Yeah, Libby, I can tell you that it is far different from what I've experienced covering the Hill. I've been here early in the morning, late at night, on the weekends, and I have never heard it this quiet. I'm in the uh, Russell Rotunda on the Senate side, where usually a lot of media, uh, we stand here, we give uh, live reports, we do interviews with members of Congress, and none of that is really happening right now. And it's really interesting to see, because when we were last here, uh, most of what we were covering was the impeachment trial, and it was certainly shoulder to shoulder and, and very busy. But from what I've seen this morning, just a hand handful of staffers are walking through the hallways, not many at all. You can almost hear a pin drop. I'm hearing my voice echo at times when I'm speaking to you because it's that quiet here. And that is a part of a new normal. And I think the, the Hill is still trying to figure its way out. Uh, the attending physician has not allowed the House to come back. He has not uh, given them the go ahead that they can return back to D.C. So that also has reduced foot traffic around the Hill. Uh, they may be returning on Friday, but uh, things are a little bit up in the air. So uh, it's interesting that such a high-profile hearing and such a historic hearing is taking place uh, during this time when uh, a lot of us as media are trying to figure out the best way to cover it uh, with uh, keeping safety in mind. So it's certainly a very, very different dynamic than what we've experienced before on the Hill. Thanks so much, Rhonda. Let's go to Yasmin now. Yasmin, James brought up an important point, uh, this question of how the individuals testifying today are viewed, right? Are, are they political in nature or are they people has, who are sort of seen as outside the political stream? Dr. Fauci has served in this position for decades through uh, administrations of both political stripes. So I'm wondering if one of the goals Democrats have is to just try to show daylight between what these experts believe and what the administration is saying or what the president himself is saying. So if they can show a difference 
between a recommendation from the head of the CDC or from Dr. Fauci and show that it contrasts or you know is contradictory to what we've heard from the president's own mouth, if that's a way that they can try to move their arguments forward? I think that's a really good point. I think, you know, these are doctors, they're public health professionals. They're the, the public health professionals advising the White House Coronavirus Task Force. You know, obviously when the president speaks, um, a lot of it is, is political. We know he's very focused on his reelection um, and, and wanting to paint the administration's response in the best possible light. I think a lot of members today are going to look for the public health perspective on how the country is doing, how safe or not safe it is to, to go back to work and start to reopen, and to see if they can get an honest assessment from the public health perspective, given, you know, what the data clearly shows shows, like James mentioned, you know, spikes in some cases um, beginning to show up, um, you know, this plateau, you, there was a lot of talk about flattening the curve, the health system never got overwhelmed to the point uh, that a lot of people feared it did, uh, that it would, you know, you didn't have people dying in the streets. And I think some members of the administration point to that as as evidence that that social distancing and, and stringent mitigation measures worked. But I think there are questions as to whether, you know, the fact that we didn't have the, the sort of downslope that you hope for, you know, the plateau, and then you see the cases start to go down, whether we are, you know, ready to reopen or whether um, coronavirus is going to be sort of endemic in the U.S. And, and what you do and how you deal with that until there's a vaccine that's that's widely available. So I think they're going to look to see if these officials are willing to give sort of a blunt and honest public health assessment, even if it's not necessarily what the president and some of his political advisors would like. They've said they want to see the country roaring back and the economy coming back. But I think a lot of experts have said we're, we're just not ready for that. You can maybe do slow phase reopenings in parts of the country that don't have such bad outbreaks, but, um, you know, certainly not the, the big reopening that that Trump and some of his advisors have often talked about. So I think some members will, will press the, the members of the administration today to see if they're willing to sort of say that honestly. And um, even if it's not necessarily what what political advisors want to hear right now. Mm. Well, the head of this committee, Lamar Alexander, will be uh, joining remotely. Now, he spoke to Chuck Todd on NBC's Meet the Press over the weekend, and, and he focused on just the economic toll this is taking and the cost this is all taking. Um, but he emphasized that the solution he sees is testing and contact tracing. Let's listen. There's not enough money to help everybody hurt when you shut down the government. So the only solution is test, trace, isolate, treatments, and vaccine. So we have to reopen the economy. We have to do it carefully. We have to let people go back to work and earn a living. And I don't see us being able to appropriate much more money to, to help provide a counter to that. All right, that's the chairman of this committee. Uh, you can see the hearing room right there, such an unusual appearance with hand sanitizer and wipes and all the seats spread so far apart. Uh, it's just really remarkable and telling about this moment. Photographers wearing masks, keeping their distance. Um, James, you know, the whole point of this hearing is reopening the economy. So for someone like Lamar Alexander, who you pointed out, you know, can be loyal to the Trump administration, but also has some independence and some ability to speak out. Um, you know, what sort of issues do Republicans need to get here today in terms of solutions and next steps forward? Yeah, I think that this kind of the the getting, I think what you'll see Republicans is do, you know, I think daylight is what Democrats are going to try to establish. And I think Republicans are going to kind of try to get these public health folks to talk about the need to balance the two, uh, you know, that, that you kind of have to, what's realistic, uh, which is sort of what we just heard in that clip, uh, what, what can actually be achieved on testing, uh, who's going to get priority, what is actually achievable on contact tracing, and, and kind of, they're going to be very focused on balance. And that is one of the challenges the president has, is he has economic people in his orbit, a lot of people in the vice president's office who are very strong on the side of reopening. Uh, and then you have the public health folks and their focus is very much on the, the public health side of things. And they're not as worried. I've heard White House people complaining about uh, the CDC director self quarantining for 14 days because he was, uh, you know, they, as far as they're concerned had a low risk exposure to a White House staffer who tested positive. And so there's there's sort of a feeling in the White House that some of these folks are too strong on, on worrying about public health and not worried enough about the economy, but frankly, that's their job. And so I think you'll see Republicans try to suss out a little bit on what, what, where do we draw the line? How do we balance it? What is realistic, especially considering that it's going to be, 
you know, it, more than a year until we get a vaccine. And so this isn't going away anytime soon. So that, that's, I think you'll, you'll try to hear sort of the, the uh, pragmatic side from Republicans. This isn't the House. You're not going to hear Republicans sort of, you know, demanding everything reopen right away. I think you'll hear a very cautious tone uh, from them as well. So we just saw some of the senators gathered. Um, you know, we 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 see uh, uh, senators with their masks on. You know, it's just just incredible to see this uh, sort of play out, especially in contrast to President Trump, who's not wearing a mask at the briefings, um, and that, that there has been a change in the recommendations and what the White House is asking its own staffers to do. Yasmin, what's the latest on sort of the mask policy and the safety policies of the White House? So our colleagues reported yesterday that, you know, White House policy now is, is that everyone needs to wear a mask. Um, at the briefing yesterday, President Trump was asked if, if he was the one who mandated this, and he said he was, uh, but he was not wearing a mask. And um, our colleagues reported that the policy will not necessarily apply to him. When the president was asked why he's not wearing a mask, he says no one gets close enough to him and he's far enough apart from everyone, so he doesn't need one. Um, so it's sort of interesting. I mean, there is this policy, the president so far has been reluctant to wear a mask in public. Uh, when Vice President Pence visited the Mayo Clinic, he didn't wear a mask, even though he was in a healthcare facility and, and the policy was that, that all visitors needed to wear masks. So, you know, this guidance from the CDC has been out for a while that everyone wear face coverings in public, but we haven't really seen it um, implemented by, by members of the administration. You saw um, several members of the administration, cabinet secretaries, you know, top officials yesterday wearing masks at the briefing, but the president still has been reluctant to. So I don't know if that'll change, um, but it is sort of interesting. It, it, it undercuts the message and the, and the recommendations a little bit when you don't see, you know, the, the leaders of the country following the advice that they're giving every other American. All right, you can see there the video monitor uh, as not only guests, but also committee members join remotely. We've seen Senator Collins of Maine. Other senators uh, we've seen this morning include Tim Kaine, Democrat of Virginia, who was just talking a moment ago uh, to Senator Burr, Republican of North Carolina. And we also saw Kelly Loeffler, uh, new Republican uh, member of the Senate from Georgia. Um, all of those members appearing in person using uh, the masks as they're supposed to. You can see Dr. Fauci there who will be beamed in remotely as well as other members of the administration um, who are assembling uh, so they can testify remotely. James, there's so much of a question of, uh, of, of just what happens next and what the role of Congress is in this moment. You know, we heard in that Alexander tape reluctance by the chairman to keep spending money. Um, and there are so many people who are hurting right now because their jobs have been lost or uh, because, you know, th their regular sources of income have dried up. So how do these senators face that question of the cost and the pay for? Yeah, well, that's, and, you know, for someone like Kelly Loeffler, who has a primary challenge in Georgia, was appointed, uh, has, has been under fire for selling stocks after she got a briefing about how bad this was going to be before sort of the public realized. Uh, it's it's a difficult balancing act because they have to kind of go out of their way to make sure that they show empathy, uh, but they also have to, uh, especially on the right, make clear that there's not a blank check. Uh, and, and Democrats have to be cautious about that too. Uh, the you know the, the national debt was already out of control before and uh, you know, now we're talking about massive disruption. And I think, you know, contact tracing in particular is especially expensive. It's very involved. Uh, it, it is very human intensive, uh, even when you use the best artificial intelligence James, technologies. James, James, I'm going to cut you off because we're getting started. The chairman, Lamar Alexander, is speaking remotely. Let's go to this committee hearing live now. Individuals in the hearing room are at least six feet apart. As a result, there's no room for the public to attend in person. Representatives of the press are working as a pool to relay their observations to colleagues. The hearing may be watched online. An unedited recording will be available on the committee's website, www.senate.gov. Witnesses are participating by video conference in a one-time exception. Some senators, including the chairman, are participating by video conference. Senators, we've been advised, may remove their masks talking to the microphone when they're in the hearing room as they're six feet apart. I'm grateful to the Rules Committee, Sergeant at Arms, the Press Gallery, the Architect of the Capitol, the Capitol Police, Committee staff, Chun Shek and Evan Griffiths, all for their hard work to keep us safe. At our hearing last Thursday, 
I said that all roads back to work and back to school run through testing. And that what our country has done so far on testing is impressive, but not nearly enough. Over the weekend, Senator Schumer, the Democratic leader, was nice enough to put out a tweet quoting half of what I said. He left out the other half, the impressive part. So let me say again what I meant by that. When I said impressive, I meant that according to the Johns Hopkins University study, the United States has tested over 9 million Americans for COVID-19. That's twice as many as any other country. We don't know what China has done. And it's more per capita than most countries, including South Korea, which many members of our committee had cited as an example of a country that had tested well. According to Dr. Deborah Burks, the United States will double testing in the month of, way, month of May, which should get us up to about 10 million tests conducted. Now, here's what I mean by impressive here in Tennessee, where I am today. First, anyone who's sick, first responder or healthcare worker can get tested. Our governor, Bill Lee, is also testing every prisoner, every resident and staff member in a nursing home. He's offered weekend drive-through testing. He's done specific outreach for testing to uh, low-income communities. A Tennessean can get a free test at the local public health department. The governor's slogan is, if in doubt, get a test. Governor Lee sent his testing goals in May to the federal government, as every state has done. The federal government is helping him make sure that he has uh, enough uh, supplies in case he has trouble getting them through the labs and the other commercial sources. As a result, our state has tested about 4% of the population. The governor hopes to increase that by 7% in May. That's one of the best in the country. This impressive level of testing is sufficient, we believe, to begin phase one of going back to work. But as I said last week, it's not nearly enough to provide confidence to 31,000 students and faculty members, but we hope will show up at the University of Tennessee campus in August when uh, school starts. Last week, I talked with UT Knoxville Chancellor Dondi Plowman about that. We said, what would persuade those 31,000 students as well as the 50 million K through 12 students in the country and the other 5,000 university students, what will persuade them to go back to campus in August? That's where the new Shark Tank comes in. Dr. Collins at the National Institutes of Health calls it RADx. We had our hearing about that on Thursday. It's a, a, a really remarkable scientific exercise to take a few early stage concepts that are swimming around in what we call that competitive Shark Tank and see if Dr. Collins and his associates can find a few new technologies to create millions of new tests that will scale up rapidly and make it more likely that students will go back to school in August. For example, uh, the FDA authorized last week its first diagnostic test using saliva that a person provides at home instead of a nose swab or blood. It authorized its first antigen test. We're hearing a lot about those, like the ones used for flu or strep throat, which involves the swabbing of a nose and you can get the result in just a few minutes. Another proposal not yet approved is to put in your mouth a sort of lollipop sponge, take a photo of that with your cell phone and send that to your doctor if it lights up, you're positive. Or the university might send that saliva lollipop to a nearby laboratory, which uh, could be a gene sequencing laboratory, which can deal with thousands of those samples uh, overnight. That same process could occur at a middle school. It could occur at a factory. Of course, anyone testing negative uh, one day can test positive the next, but such widespread screening of entire campuses, schools, or places of work will help identify those who are sick trace down those who are exposed, and that in turn should help persuade the rest of us to go back to school and back to work. In addition to more testing, I expect Dr. Fauci talked to us about additional treatments that will be available to reduce the risk of death and the administration's plan to do something that our country has never done before, which is to start manufacturing a vaccine before it actually has been proven to work in order to speed up the result in case it does work. Those vaccines, those treatments are the ultimate solution. But until we have them, all roads back to work and school go through testing. 
The more tests we conduct, the better we can identify those who are sick and exposed, and we can quarantine the sick and exposed instead of trying to quarantine the whole country. Now, in my opinion, this requires millions of new tests, many from new technologies. Some of these will fail, but we only need a few successes uh, to get where we want to go. That's why I said on Thursday that what our country had done so far in testing is impressive, but not nearly enough. First, squeeze all the tests we can out of current technologies. Next, uh, try to find new technologies to help us contain the disease and persuade us to go back to work. Now, one other thing. This is a bipartisan hearing to examine how well we're preparing to go safely back to work and to school and to determine what else we need to do in the United States Senate. Such an exercise sometimes encourages finger pointing. Before we spend too much time finger pointing, I'd like to suggest that almost all of us, the United States and almost every country, so far as I can tell, underestimated this virus, underestimated how contagious it would be, underestimated uh, how, how it can travel silently in people without symptoms to infect other people, how it can be especially deadly for certain segments of our population, uh, the elderly, those with pre-existing conditions, minority population. Let me go back to the March 3rd hearing that we had in our committee on coronavirus. Six weeks after the first case was discovered in the United States, a day when only two deaths were recorded in this country, I read at that hearing this paragraph from the New York Times two days earlier on March the 1st. They reported this. Much about the coronavirus remains unclear, the Times reported, and it's far from certain, this is March 3rd, that March 1, that, that the outbreak will reach severe proportions in the United States or affect many regions at once. With its top-notch scientists, modern hospitals, and sprawling public health infrastructure, most experts agree the United States is among the country's best prepared to prevent or manage such an epidemic. It was the New York Times on March 1. A lot of effort has gone into trying to make our country well prepared. Over the last 20 years, four presidents, several Congresses, uh, in response to 9-11, bird flu, Katrina, Ebola, H1N1, MERS, passed nine major laws that, to try to help get this country ready for what we're going through today. These laws stood up the strategic national stockpile, created an assistant secretary for preparedness. Uh, it, it, uh, it created incentives for the developments of vaccines uh, and, and medicines that we're using today, strengthened the Centers for Disease Control, created BARDA, uh, thanks to the leadership of Senator Blunt and Senator Murray for five straight years. We've significantly increased funding for the National Institutes of Health. All this was part of a shared goal. Democrats, Republicans, four presidents, several Congresses, to try to get ready for what we're going through today, whether it was known like anthrax or unknown like COVID-19. But despite all that effort, even the experts underestimated COVID-19. This hearing is about how we improve our response to this virus as well as the next one. During the oversight hearing, I also intend to focus on, as I just said, the next pandemic, which we know is coming. What can we learn from this one to be ready for the next one? Can we, what can we learn from the fast tracking of vaccines and, and, and treatments that we're about to hear about that will make it even faster the next time? How can we keep hospitals and states from selling off protective equipment when their budget gets tight? How can we make sure Congress does our share of the funding responsibility? How do we provide enough extra hospital beds without without canceling elective surgery, hurting other patients and bankrupting hospitals. Whose job should it be to coordinate supply lines so that protective equipment and supplies get where they're supposed to go when they're supposed to go? What's the best way to manage the stockpile? My preacher once said, I'm not worried about what you do on Sunday, it's the rest of the week that concerns me. I'm afraid that during the rest of the week between pandemics, we relax our focus on preparedness. 
we become preoccupied with other important things. Our collective memory is short. Just three months ago, this country was preoccupied with impeaching a president. Now that seems like ancient Roman history. Now, while this crisis has our full attention, I believe we should put into law this year whatever improvements need to be made to be well prepared for the next pandemic. If there is to be finger pointing, I hope they're pointed in that direction. We're fortunate today to have four distinguished witnesses who are at the heart of the response to the coronavirus. We're grateful for their service to our country. I've asked them each to summarize their remarks in five minutes. Then we'll have five minute round of questions from each senator. I've agreed we'll end our hearing about 1230 after we have a full round of questions. Every senator will have a chance to have his or her five minutes. Senator Murray will then have an opportunity to uh, ask the last question or to close the hearing and I will then close the hearing. There will be other hearings to follow this hearing like last Thursday's hearing and senators may submit their questions in writing within the next 10 days. Staying at home indefinitely is not the solution to this pandemic. There is not enough money available to help all those hurt by a closed economy. All roads back to work and back to school lead through testing, tracking, isolation, treatment, and vaccines. This requires widespread testing. Millions more tests created mostly by new technologies to identify those who are sick and who've been exposed so they can be quarantined and by containing the disease in this way, give the rest of America enough confidence to go back to work and school. For the near term, to help make sure those 31,000 UT students and faculty members show up in August, we need widespread testing. Millions more tests created mostly by new technologies to identify those who are sick and who've been exposed so they can be quarantined and by containing the disease in this way, give the rest of America enough confidence to go back to work and back to school. Senator Murray. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My thoughts are with you and your team right now as you try to navigate the same challenge so many in our country are worried about. We all wish your staff member a speedy recovery. And as everyone works to take appropriate safety precautions today, I'd like to thank not only our witnesses for joining us today, but also our committee staff for working to set up a safe format for members and witnesses and the public to participate in this hearing remotely. Families across the country are counting on us for the truth about the COVID-19 pandemic especially since it is clear they will not get it from President Trump. Truth is essential so people have the facts so they can make decisions for themselves and their families and their community. Lives are at stake. If the president isn't telling the truth, we must and our witnesses must and we're counting on you today. And families need us to take this opportunity to dig into the facts about where things did go wrong so we can finally get them on track. Because the Trump administration's response to this public health emergency so far has been a disaster all on its own. Delays, missteps have put us way behind where we need to be on diagnostic tests and allowed inaccurate antibody tests to flood the market. Corruption and political interference have impeded efforts to secure desperately needed personal protective equipment and promoted dangerous unproven treatments. And we recently learned that after experts at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention spent weeks developing a detailed guide to help our communities understand how to safely reopen when the time comes, the Trump administration tossed it in the trash bin for being too prescriptive. But this is far from the first time this administration has silenced experts who were doing their job and putting public health first. The fact of the matter is President Trump has been more focused on fighting against the truth than fighting this virus, and Americans have sadly paid the price. Since this committee last heard from these witnesses on March 3rd, we have seen over 900 deaths in my home state of Washington, over 80 
1,000 deaths nationally, and the numbers continue to climb. Still, President Trump is trying to ignore the facts and ignore the experts who've been very clear we are nowhere close to where we need to be to reopen safely. My hope today is that we can cut through this and have a serious discussion about what is needed to safely open, how close we are as a country to meeting those needs, and how we actually get there. One thing that's abundantly clear, we need dramatically more testing. It is unacceptable we still don't have a national strategic plan to make sure testing is free, fast, and everywhere. That is why I fought to make sure our last COVID-19 package included an initial $25 billion testing fund and a requirement that the administration submit a plan by May 24th. And when I say a plan, I don't mean a PR plan. I mean a plan with specific timelines and numeric goals for supply and funding needs, one that actually addresses the issues we're seeing on testing capacity and distribution and disparities and building out our public health system. And makes clear to states and tribes and employers and the American people what they can expect and what the administration will do to keep Americans safe. But testing alone won't be enough to reopen our country. We still need far more personal protective equipment that has been available for our healthcare workers on the front line. And we will need far more for other workers as we reopen. So we desperately need this administration to step up and get that equipment to states who are doing everything in their power to purchase supplies, but simply cannot get nearly enough. Because the reality is, unlike states, the federal government has the tools to actually fix the problem if only the administration would use them. And we also need that equipment to actually work and for the FDA to act promptly if it does not, not weeks later when people may have already been exposed. And just as importantly, we can't expect people to go back to work or to restaurants or to confidently send their kids to school if there isn't clear, detailed guidance about how to do that safely. Schools, from early childhood through college, need to know how to keep their students, their staff, and their educators safe. When should they wear masks? How do you run a school cafeteria or a school bus? And if they can't reopen classrooms, schools and families need to know we are working to ensure every student gets an education. Tools like online learning can only get us so far if we don't address the digital divide that, so that every student can access them. And even then, there will be learning loss that could deepen existing educational disparities among low-income students, students with disabilities, English language learners, and other vulnerable populations if we don't make sure they get equal access to resources and support. And of course, schools aren't the only workplaces we've got to be thinking about. We need to make sure that industries across the country know how to safely reopen and that people know their workplace is safe. Secretary Scalia needs to stop dragging his feet and do his job and have the Department of Labor set forward a rule that makes clear worker safety is not optional. Mr. Chairman, I hope this committee can hear about those critical issues from Secretary Scalia and Secretary DeVos, as well as other experts in the space in the days ahead. And this is especially important to protect workers and residents at our nursing homes and other congregate care facilities where we've seen some of the most deadly outbreaks. And as the rash of outbreaks at meatpacking plants shows, this isn't just an issue for the healthcare industry, it is an issue for everyone. And just as we need a plan before we can start to reopen, we also need a plan well before we have a safe and effective vaccine to guarantee that we can quickly produce and distribute it on a global scale and make it free and available for everyone. So I'll be asking about our progress on those issues today. Today, safely reopening our country may be a ways off and the administration's planning may be way behind, but there's still a lot that Congress needs to do. There isn't time to spare. Some, including the White House, say we've already provided enough economic relief. Well, my question to them is what good is a bridge that only gets you to the middle of the river? We don't need to wait around to see if people need more help. We know they do. 
We need to work quickly on another aggressive relief package and we need to make sure our priorities in that bill are protecting our workers, our students and our families and addressing this public health crisis, not bailing out corporations or protecting big business from accountability. People across the country are doing their part. They are washing their hands and wearing masks and social distancing and staying home. They need their government to do its part too. They need leadership, they need a plan, they need honesty, and they need it now before we reopen so they can rest assured that we are doing things safely and competently with their health and well being as a top priority. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this hearing, uh, it's an important hearing, and I know lots of people may be watching it for the first time. If they are, um, I hope they notice that we have 23 members of this committee, I believe, one more Republican than Democrat. We have some very strong views, but we're able to work together and to express those views and respect each other and our witnesses. And I, and a big part of that goes to uh, Senator Murray and her staff. So thank you for that. Each witness will have up to five minutes to give his, his testimony. Thank you for making an exception and agreeing to testify by video because of these unusual circumstances and thank you for what you're doing for our country. Our first witness is Dr. Anthony Fauci. Uh, he's director of the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the National Institutes of Health. He's held that position for not, since 1984, which meant he's advised six presidents and worked on HIV, AIDS, influenza, malaria, Ebola, and other infectious infectious diseases. He was involved in treating Ebola patients at NIH and also worked on vaccine trials for Ebola. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Robert Redfield. He's director of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which has its headquarters in Atlanta. More than 30 years, he's been involved with clinical research related to chronic human viral infections and infectious diseases, especially HIV. He was the founding director of the Department of Retroviral Research within the U.S. military's HIV research program. He spent 20 years with the U.S. Army Medical Corps. Third, Admiral Brett Giroir. Admiral Giroir is Assistant Secretary for Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, that puts him in charge of development of public health policy recommendations. He's taken on the responsibility for coordinating testing and focused on the increasing number of tests that we can do with existing technology. His federal service includes a variety of activities with our defense uh, department uh, and advanced research, threat reduction. He was part of the Blue Ribbon Panel to reform the U.S. veterans health system. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Stephen Hahn. Uh, he's commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. Before jo joining FDA, uh, he was the chief medical executive of the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. And he was chair of the Department of Radiation Oncology at the University of Pennsylvania. He was a senior investigator at the National Institutes of Health, was commander of the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps in 2025. Now we'll ask each of our witnesses to summarize their remarks in five minutes. Following that, uh, each senator will have five minutes for question and answers in order of seniority. Dr. Fauci, let's begin with you. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Murray, and members of the committee. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to discuss with you today the role of the National Institutes of Health in research addressing COVID-19. The strategic plan that we have is fourfold. One, to improve our fundamental knowledge of the virus and the disease it causes. Next, to develop new point of care diagnostics. Next, to characterize and test therapeutics. And finally, to develop safe and effective vaccines. First, with regard to diagnostics. As you probably heard from Dr. Francis Collins last Thursday, the NIH has developed a rapid acceleration of diagnostics program called RADx, with an award to that specific program up to a half a billion dollars to support the development of COVID-19 diagnostics. It is a national call for innovative technologies that will be evaluated in a shark tank 
like selection process to get to either success or failure rapidly. Moving on to therapeutics, I'll talk a bit about the remdesivir success antiviral in a moment, but let me emphasize that there are a number of broad spectrum antivirals that are in various stages of testing. In addition, we will be looking at convalescent plasma, which is plasma from individuals who've recovered from COVID-19 to be used in passive transfer, either in prevention or treatment. In addition, hyperimmune globulin, which can be used as a gamma globulin shot. We'll be looking at repurposed drugs, as well as immune-based therapies and host modifiers, <clears throat> and finally, monoclonal antibodies. Let me take a moment to describe the remdesivir placebo-controlled randomized trial, which was done internationally with a power of more than 1,000 individuals in sites throughout the world. It was in hospitalized patients with lung disease. The endpoint was primarily time to recovery. The result was statistically significant, but really modest. And we must remember, it was only a modest result showing that the drug made a 31% faster time to recovery. We hope to build on this modest success with combinations of drugs and better drugs. Moving on to vaccines, there are at least eight candidate COVID-19 vaccines in clinical development. The NIH has been collaborating with a number of pharmaceutical companies at various stages of development. I will describe one very briefly, which is not the only one, but one that we have been involved in heavily developing with Moderna. It's a messenger RNA platform. You might recall in this committee that in January of this year, I said that it would take about one year to 18 months if we were successful in developing a vaccine. The NIH trial moved very quickly. On January 10th, the sequence was known. On January the 11th, the Vaccine Research Center met to develop a plan. On the 14th of January, we officially started the vaccine development. 62 days later, we are now in phase one clinical trial with the two doses already fully enrolled. There will be animal safety. The phase one will directly go into phase two, three in late spring and early summer. And if we are successful, we hope to know that in the late fall and early winter. There are some important issues, however, in COVID-19 vaccine development. We have many candidates and hope to have multiple winners. In other words, it's multiple shots on goal. This will be important because this will be good for global availability if we have more than one successful candidate. We also, as the chairman mentioned, will be producing vaccine at risk which means we'll be investigating considerable resources in developing doses even before we know any given candidate or candidates work. I must warn that there's also the possibility of negative consequences where certain vaccines can actually enhance the negative effect of the infection. The big unknown is efficacy. Will it be present or absence and how durable will it be? And finally, I wanna mention the NIH has launched a public-private partnership called Accelerating COVID-19 Therapeutic Interventions and Vaccines. The purpose of that is to prioritize and accelerate clinical evaluation of therapeutic candidates with near-term potential. Hopefully, our research efforts, together with the other public health efforts, will get us quickly to an end to this terrible ordeal that we are all going through. Thank you very much. Happy to answer questions later. Thank you, Dr. Fauci. Uh, Dr. Redfield, welcome. Good morning, uh, Chairman Alexander and Ranking Member Murray and members of the committee. Our nation is confronting the most serious public health crisis in more than a century. Yet we're not defenseless. We have powerful tools to fight this enemy. We have tried and true effective public health interventions, such as early case identification, isolation, and contact tracing, combined with important mitigation strategies include social distancing, frequent hand washing, and face covering. These public health tools have and will continue to slow the spread of COVID-19. I appreciate the opportunity this morning to provide a brief overview of some of CDC's ongoing work in response to COVID-19. CDC has been working 24 seven to combat the pandemic. CDC's Emergency Operations Center is supporting state, tribal, local, and territorial public health partners 
in building core capabilities, particularly workforce, laboratory, and data and predictive analytics. Epidemiologists are conducting surveillance for COVID-19 as well as conducting health system surveillance. Community mitigation teams are providing guidance on infection control and contact tracing. And our laboratory experts are performing ser serological testing to better define the extent of asymptomatic populations. As local leadership makes decisions to reopen, they'll require varying degrees of federal support. Each location will be different and will face unique circumstances. CDC has conducted a state-by-state -state assessment of public health testing capacity and key contact tracing capacity, as well as surge plans. CDC is providing technical assistance and funding to the states provided through the Supplemental CARES Act and the Paycheck Protection Program and Health Care Enhancement Act. We're working directly with the state public health leaders to define their needs for testing and testing devices, supplies and manpower, surveillance, data collection and reporting, contact tracing, infection control, and outbreak investigation. I want to spend a moment to focus on several key elements. First, testing. Rapid, extensive, and widely available timely testing is essential for reopening America. CDC's role in testing continues to support diagnosis and contact tracing, surveillance, and outbreak. When we work with the public health partners to define their particular testing strategy for their jurisdiction. Admiral Gerard will address the testing components of the response in greater detail. Contact tracing. Increasing state, tribal, local, and territorial contact tracing capacity is critical. It's a critical part to stop the chains of transmission and prevent the occurrence of sustained community transmission. CDC's role is to provide technical training, assistance, and support to the states as they hire and build a workforce necessary to be fully prepared to effectively respond to the public health challenges posed by the ongoing COVID pandemic. This will be an expansive effort. Surveillance. Our nation's surveillance program is built on a combination of systems, including existing, existing syndromic, influenza, and respiratory or viral disease surveillance systems that have been combined with commercial and research lab platforms and our case reporting form system. CDC is adapting these and optimizing it uh, to have a surveillance system in response to COVID-19. Importantly, in light of the significant occurrence of asymptomatic infection, the surveillance for asymptomatic infections becomes an important public health tool for early case identification. CDC is working with each public health jurisdiction to develop a prospective surveillance program to include active surveillance among those that are most vulnerable such as individuals in long-term care facilities, inner city clinics, and homeless shelters. We need to rebuild our nation's public health infrastructure. Data and data analytics, public health laboratory resilience, and our nation's public health workforce. Now's the time to put it in place for the generations to come, not only for the public health system that our nation needs, but for the public health system that our nation deserves. Before I close, I wanna recognize the tireless commitment of the dedicated CDC staff who've deployed to every corner of this nation uh, um, to fight COVID-19. More than 4,000 employees have deployed here and globally. Science and data continue with technical expertise and public service to be the backbone of CDC's contributions to the U.S. response. I extend my serious gratitude to the healthcare workers in the front lines, as well as their family and the essential emergency personnel, as well as the American people to say thank you for adhering to the stay at home guidelines and protecting the most vulnerable. It's important to emphasize that we're not out of the woods yet. The battle contends and we must, but we are more prepared. We need to stay vigilant with social distancing. It remains an imperative. We are a resilient nation and I am confident that we will emerge from this pandemic stronger together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Redfield. Uh, Admiral DeWalt, welcome. be here to provide you with an update on the nation's progress in testing for COVID-19. On March 12th, Secretary Azar requested that I lead the COVID-19 testing efforts within HHS, including oversight and coordination of the FDA and CDC with regard to testing. Since then, the nation has performed more than 9 million COVID-19 tests, a number far greater than any other country, 
and double the per capita tests performed to date in South Korea. To reach this point, we implemented a phased approach to meet testing needs during mitigation and now during phase one reopening of America. Beginning March 20th, we pioneered 41 community-based drive-through testing sites in locations prioritized by the CDC. These sites have been a profound success, testing over 167,000 high-risk individuals and demonstrating a prototype that is being duplicated multifold in nearly every state. Next, the administration leveraged trusted retailers, including CVS, Rite Aid, Walgreens, Walmart, Kroger, and Health Mart, who are now providing testing at 240 locations in 33 states, 69% of which are in communities with moderate to high social vulnerability. To meet the need for collection supplies, like swabs and media tubes, we first secured the global supply chain through a military air bridge. We worked directly with manufacturers to increase domestic production. We collaborated with the private sector and the FDA to validate multiple swab and media types that vastly expanded supplies while minimizing the need for PPE. Finally, we used Title III of the Defense Production Act to further invest in domestic manufacturing to prepare us for reopening. To support the need for surveillance testing during reopening, on April 27th, we issued a new testing framework that also prioritized testing for persons without symptoms who are prioritized by health departments or clinicians for any reason, including screening of asymptomatic individuals according to state and local plans. Next, our federal multidisciplinary team conducted multiple calls with leadership from each state to set state-specific testing objectives. Collectively, states and territories established an overall goal to perform 12.9 million tests over the next four weeks. The federal government is able to and will support the achievement of this goal. Specifically, the federal government is shipping to states 12.9 million swabs and over 9.7 million tubes of media in May alone. Last month, we also detailed the location and capacity of every lab machine in every state that could potentially run COVID-19 assays, and our team has worked with test suppliers to match reagents to these machines. Looking forward, between now and the end of 2020, the federal government will procure over 135 million swabs and 132 million tubes of media and distribute these to states as requested to supplement the now robust commercial supply. We anticipate marked increases in current tests, as well as a dramatic expansion of new point of care tests, like the first in class Quidel antigen test authorized by the FDA just last Friday. Quidel anticipates being able to distribute 300,000 tests per day within just a few weeks. So by September, taking every aspect of development, authorization, manufacturing, and supply chain into consideration, we project that our nation will be capable of performing at least 40 to 50 million tests per month if needed at that time. And if new technologies are authorized, like whole genome sequencing approaches or any novel solutions uncovered by NIH's new diagnostics initiative, that number will be much higher. Finally, I want to acknowledge and express my heartfelt gratitude to the officers of the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps, the uniform service I am honored to lead. 3,471 men and women have deployed in support of this pandemic on the cruise ship in Japan, to our military bases repatriating Americans, to our community-based testing sites and international airports, to FEMA and our task forces, to nursing facilities, including King County, Washington, and to field hospitals and hard-hit communities across our nation. I thank each and every one of these officers and their families, and on their behalf, I thank the members of this committee for supporting our training needs and the establishment of a ready reserve to supplement our ranks in future national emergencies. Thank you for the opportunity to provide these remarks. Thank you, Admiral Giroir. And now Dr. Stephen Hahn, our fourth and final witness. Chairman Alexander, <clears throat> Ranking Member Murray, and members of the committee, <clears throat> thank you for inviting me to participate in this hearing today. 
I first want to start by thanking the American people for their incredible efforts at mitigation and extend my condolences to those who have lost loved ones. <clears throat> From day one of this pandemic, the 18,000 FDA employees who are just incredible scientists, doctors, and nurses have taken an active role in the all of government response to this pandemic. FDA has worked to facilitate the development of medical countermeasures to diagnose, treat, and prevent COVID-19. We've worked closely with laboratories, manufacturers, academia, product developers, our federal partners, and companies, companies that don't even make medical products but want to pitch in, for example, by making hand sanitizer, personal protective equipment, and ventilators. Every decision we have made have been driven by data with the goal of protecting the health of the American people. In a public health emergency, however, our response has balanced the urgent need to make medical products available with the provision of a level of oversight that helps ensure the safety and effectiveness of those medical products. I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you what FDA is doing to help the country at this point, um, and which America is judged as safe to return to work and to school. It starts with testing, as others have mentioned. FDA has worked with more than 500 developers who have or said they will be submitting emergency use authorization requests for COVID-19 tests. This includes some newer technologies that, not, that heretofore have not been used as part of diagnostic tests in response to a pandemic. We have issued 92 individual emergency use authorizations for test kit manufacturers and laboratories, and we've been informed by more than 250 laboratories they have begun testing under the regulatory flexibilities we outlined in March. <clears throat> we are conducting rolling reviews of EUA submissions so that we can quickly authorize tests in which the data support. In a public health emergency, the accuracy of diagnostic tests is important, not only for the individual patient, but for the patient at large, for the public at large. FDA is helping to ensure the availability of tests that are providing accurate answers. We are also monitoring the marketplace for fraudulent tests and are taking appropriate action to protect the public health. And we are working to provide more clarity about which tests have been reviewed and authorized by FDA and which have not. Serologic tests will play a role in our recovery. Unlike diagnostic tests, which detect the presence of the virus, serologic tests measure the amount of antibodies or protein present in the blood when the body is responding to an infection like COVID-19. These tests can help identify individuals who can overcome an infection and who have developed an immune response. We will continue working with labs, manufacturers, and across the government to find a balance between the assurance that an antibody test is accurate and timely access to such tests. Of course, the way we will eventually beat this virus is with a vaccine, and FDA is working closely with our Fed partners, including the NIH, Test of, I mean, vaccine developers, manufacturers, and experts across the globe. We intend to use our regulatory flexibility to help ensure the most ensure efficient development of a safe and effective vaccine to prevent COVID-19. Until a preventative vaccine is approved, however, we need medical products to bridge the gap. FDA has been working for several months to facilitate the development and availability of therapeutics as expeditiously as possible. And we've created an emergency program for this acceleration called the Corona Treatment, Coronavirus Treatment Acceleration Program, or CTAP. We have reassigned staff to work with urgency to review requests from companies, scientists, doctors who are developing therapies. And we're using every available authority and regulatory flexibility that's appropriate to facilitate the development of safe and effective products to treat COVID-19. A variety of therapeutic areas are being evaluated, as mentioned by Dr. Fauci and others, including antiviral drugs and immunotherapies, um, as well as convalescent plasma, hyperimmune globulin, and monoclonal antibodies. As Dr. Fauci also mentioned, we recently announced the positive results of the NIAID trial of remdesivir and issued an EUA for the treatment of hospitalized patients with COVID-19. Two other promising uh, treatments that I mentioned are the antibody-rich products, convalescent plasma and hyperimmunoglobulin, and I am certainly willing to go into more detail if uh, members of this committee have question, uh, questions about this. But we are working very aggressively and closely with stakeholders to, the to, to facilitate the development of monoclonal antibodies, which, if shown to be safe and effective, could act as a bridge therapy to the development of a vaccine. 
We recognize that developing vaccines and therapies need to go hand in hand with ensuring that there will be sufficient supplies for our companies, for our country. So we're also working with manufacturers to make sure that this supply chain is robust. Mr. Chairman, ranking member and members of the committee, please know that in FDA, you have a dedicated team of some of the nation's finest scientists, healthcare providers, and public health professionals. We are guided by science and data, and we won't let up until we facilitate the development of products that our nation needs to get back to work. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Hahn, and thanks to uh, all four of you for your expertise, for your dedication to our country, and your hard work. We'll now begin a round of five-minute questions for, from each senator on the committee, alternating between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, each senator has, if you're by video conference, you have a little time clock at the bottom, and I would ask you to try to stay within five minutes for your questions and answers. I will start, uh, I'm, I've got a question for Dr. Fauci and then Admiral Jirwa. Uh, doctor, let's look down the road three months. There'll be about uh, 5,000 campuses across the country trying to welcome 20 million college students, um, 100,000 public schools welcoming 50 million students. What would you say to the Chancellor of the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, or the president or, or the principal of a public school about how to persuade parents and students to return to school in August? Let's start with treatments and vaccines first. Dr. Fauci, and if you could save about half of my five minutes for Admiral Jawa for testing, I would appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, I would be re very realistic with the chancellor and tell him that when we're thinking in terms it's a her in this case. Oh, okay. I would tell her, I'm sorry, sir, uh, that in this case, that the idea of having treatments available or a vaccine to facilitate the re-entry of students into the fall term would be something that would be a bit of a bridge too far. As I mentioned, the drug that has shown some degree of, uh, of efficacy was modest and it was in hospitalized patients not yet or maybe ever to be used either yet as prophylaxis or treatment. So if the issue is that the young individuals who will be going back to school would like to have some comfort in that there's a treatment, probably the thing that would be closest to utilization then would likely be passive transfer of convalescent serum. But we're really not talking about necessarily treating a student who gets ill but how the student will feel safe in going back to school. If this were a situation where we had a vaccine, that would really be the end of that issue in a positive way. But as I mentioned in my opening remarks, even at the top speed we're going, we don't see a vaccine playing in the ability of individuals to get back to school this term. What they really want is to know if they are safe. And that's the question that'll have to be due with what we discussed earlier about testing. So I'm about halfway through the remarks. I'd like to just pass the baton to Admiral Giroir, who would address the, the, the question of the availability of testing and what role that might play in returning to school. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Fauci. And Admiral Giroir, you, you said that while we're doing about 10 million tests this month, that we might be as high as 40 or 50 million by September and, and uh, a month, which is a significant increase. So if I'm chancellor of the University of Tennessee, could I develop a strategy where I'd say to all my students, we have, for example, an antigen test, which is quick and easy. We want everybody on campus to come by and take it once before you be begin school. That will at least let everybody know that on that day, we've isolated anybody who's positive, and then we can continue to monitor. Is that strategy possible in August and September? So, so thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I may reserve 20 seconds for uh, Dr. Redfield as well. Um, the strategy that's going to be employed really depends heavily on what's the community spread at that time. If there's almost no community spread, your strategy will be different. If there's high community spread, it will also be different. But yes, technically, uh, we will have the ability and your chancellor will have the ability. Uh, we expect there to be 25 to 30 million point of care tests per month available. Uh, it is certainly possible to test all of the students, or it is much more likely 
that there would be a surveillance strategy done where you may test some of the students at different times to give an assurance that there's no circulation, and that would be done in conjunction with the CDC and the local health department. There's also strategies that are still needing to be validated, but of pooling samples. Um, we know in some experimental labs, as many as 10 or 20 samples can be pooled, so essentially one test could test 20 students. And finally, there are some experimental pro approaches that look uh, interesting, if not promising, that, for example, wastewater from an entire dorm or an entire segment of a campus could be tested uh, to determine whether there's coronavirus in that, uh, that sewerage, the wastewater. Um, so there are other strategies being developed. And I'd like to at least give 20 seconds to Dr. Redfield, who will really will be working on the strategy of how to employ the test given different community spreads. Dr. Red Redfield? Yeah, just some quick comments, sir. I mean, first, I think it's really important to evaluate critically the, the role of changes in social distancing on college campuses and, high, and schools and the situation, not to forget the importance of what we've learned. Uh, clearly, also developing an aggressive program for wellness education, uh, making sure people understand when they're symptomatic, they need to seek evaluation. I think you are going to have to uh, look at the role of testing. I think there is going to be an important role of testing in this circumstances, and I I think it will be individualized based on where these different schools are, where they, how much infection is in yeah, that region. I'm going to wrap it up there so I can set a good example for the other senators with their five minutes. Yeah. Senator Murray. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you to all of our witnesses. Um, Dr. Fauci, you have warned of needless suffering and death if we push to reopen too soon. But the president has actually been sending the opposite message. I want to ask you today, what is the most important message you have for communities and states that are reopening, even as our public health experts make it clear it's too soon? Tell us what the consequences are. Thank you very much for that question, Senator Murray. As I've said many times publicly, what we have worked out is a guideline framework of how to safely uh, open America again. And there are several checkpoints in that with a gateway first of showing, depending on the dynamics of an outbreak in a particular region, state, city, or area, that would really determine the speed and the pace with which one does re-enter or reopen. So my, my word has been, and I've been very consistent in this, that I get concerned if you have a situation where the dynamics of an outbreak in an area are such that you are not seeing that gradual over 14 day decrease that would allow you to go to phase one. And then if you pass the checkpoints of phase one, go to phase two and phase three. What I've expressed then and again is my concern that if some areas, cities, states, or what have you, jump over those various checkpoints and prematurely open up without having the capability of being able to respond effectively and efficiently, my concern is that we will start to see little spikes that might turn into outbreaks. So therefore, I have been being very clear in my message to try to the best extent possible to go by the guidelines, which have been very well thought out and very well delineated. So if a community or a state or a region doesn't go by those guidelines and reopen, <clears throat> The consequences could be pretty dire, correct? The consequences could be uh, uh, really uh, serious, uh, particularly, and this is something that I think we also should pay attention to, that states, even if they're doing it at an appropriate pace, which many of them are and will, namely a pace that's commensurate with the dynamics of the outbreak, that they have in place already the capability that when there will be cases, there is no doubt, even under the best of circumstances, when you pull back on mitigation, you will see some cases appear. It's the ability and the capability of responding to those cases with good identification, isolation, and contact tracing will determine whether you can continue to go forward as you try to reopen America. So it's not only doing it at the appropriate time, with the appropriate constraints, but having in place the capability of responding when the inevitable return of infections occur. 
Well, thank you for that. And it's very clear in order to do that, we need knowledge, which is about testing. And for months, this administration's approach to testing has really been plagued by unrealized goals and disregard for systemic problems within that supply chain. And last week, an average of just 250,000 tests per day were performed in the United States. That is a small fraction of what we need. And yesterday, President Trump had the gall to declare the U.S. had, quote, prevailed on testing in a press, press conference that was filled with misinformation and distortion. Dr. Girard, public health experts do not think the U.S. has prevailed. I'm glad you finally committed that states, including my home state of Washington, will receive enough tests to meet their goals for May and June. But this administration has had a record of giving us broken promises that more tests and supplies are coming and they don't. And we know, by the way, that testing is gonna, uh, needs will persist long past June, long past. Um, so I wanted to ask you today, will the administration's forthcoming strategic plan that is now required under the COVID package that was just passed and signed into law, Will that strategic plan on testing include specific numeric targets for testing capacity, supply chain capacity, and projection of shortages? Thank you for that question uh, and, and statement, Senator Murray. Yes, we are, as uh, I've stated, we continue to have a work in, uh, in progress as we build the testing capacity. Um, we have established the targets uh, with the states of over 12 million tests over the next four weeks. Uh, we think those targets are going to be good um, in May and June. But as uh, Dr. Fauci said, we really have to be evidence-based. We expect those targets to go up uh, as we uh, progressively open it, as communities go through phase one and then into phase two. And certainly those numbers will need to go up significantly again in the fall. Uh, when we potentially have uh, influenza circulating with, with COVID. So yes, there will be targets. The targets will need to change based on the evidence that we see, but we are highly committed uh, to securing the supply chain. We've worked daily with every manufacturer, um, and I'm just pleased we're in May and June able to get ahead of the states so that we can supply them what they need so they have those assurances. So, so there's so not my, gonna be any doubts so about my that. my question to you is when you put out that um, specific plan that you are required to do, we will see numbers that you are going to tell us that you will reach targeted for testing and supply chain capacity and protection of source. Instead of just saying, we hope to have a million this week, next week. So you will give us the specific targets, correct? We know specific, I'll say yes, ma'am. We know the specific, we know the specific amounts of tests we have over the, over the summer. We uh, have how many we need. So, um, yes, ma'am, um, we developed the need statements by working with the states individually, with epidemiologists, with the CDC, um, so that overall in May, we'll be testing about 3.9% of the overall okay. U.S. population. I, I'm fine, but what I'm, I'm telling you well over time, Senator Murray. how many we have, but how many will, we will need, not just for May, but in the coming months so that we can be prepared to have them. Yes, ma'am, and, and not to be repetitive, but um, we need to be evidence and data driven because what, what we may see in May or June will drive differences in the amount of test goals we have. So we, we really just need to be very humble about this. We need to look at the data. We know that the testing needs will go up over May and June as we progressively open, uh, and we will do our best to predict that, but you have to understand we have to see what the data and the evidence show at that time. Okay, I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, again, what our strategic plan requires is what is the goal? Not how many we have, but how many we need. And that's what we'll be looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Murray. Senator Enzi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I particularly appreciated your opening statement where you had a very succinct list of preparations we need to learn from this pandemic for the next one. Um, not only should we be working on this and preparing, but we need to look at the future too. And I think we've learned a lot. Uh, we're fighting a virus at the same time that scientists are learning about it. Um, so we need to be nimble. We also need to be sure that we are prepared for a second wave of outbreak that could coincide with the start of the flu season, uh, potentially stressing our healthcare system even more than it already has been. 
Um, Admiral Jura, I, I thank you for your comments. I think they've been uh, comforting about what has been done and what can be done. Um, I agree with uh, Senator Murray that we need to have some uh, specific goals as an accountant. That's always one of the things that I'm looking for. Uh, for questions, Dr. Dr. Hahn, um, our understanding of the clinical picture of COVID-19 continues to evolve. Uh, what first looked like a respiratory illness now seems much more comprehensive, uh, potentially affecting the uh, heart, the brain, the kidneys, and other organs. How does this evolving picture impact the ability to evaluate the appropriate clinical or surrogate endpoints for review of vaccines and treatment? Thank you, Senator, uh, for that question. <clears throat> the, uh, the evolving clinical picture and obviously the, uh, the way this is manifesting um, around the country clinically does in fact inform the endpoints that we will work with uh, uh, developers of therapies on um, so that we can get the absolute most efficient but also the most accurate information and appropriate endpoints uh, to make the necessary authorizations and approvals. Um, we uh, have set up this uh, program called the Coronavirus Treatment Acceleration Program, where our top scientists and clinicians have been at the table consulting uh, with uh, our colleagues at NIH and CDC to actually address those questions. What are the appropriate endpoints? I'll give you an example. We do know that in some uh, uh, circumstances, uh, patients who've had severe COVID disease have developed thrombotic or clotting type episodes. And so we prioritize a review of agents that we think might be beneficial. And obviously the clinical endpoints for those trials will be different than an agent that's an antiviral like remdesivir, whereas Dr. Fauci mentioned, we're looking at time to recovery. So we want to adapt it to the, the clinical circumstance as well as to the type of therapy that's put before us. Thank you. Uh, another question to Dr. Hahn. Uh, we have made a lot of progress in vaccine development but uh, BARDA has identified that domestic manufacturing of needles and syringes is a significant gap in pandemic preparedness. What has HHS uh, done in advance of a potential national vaccination campaign to ensure that we have sufficient capacity to administer a vaccine? Senator Enzi, thank you for that question. This is a really important point because um, as you mentioned, it's not just about the vaccine or hopefully vaccines, that are developed. It's all about uh, the. It's also about the supplies that are needed, as well as an operational plan for uh, administering the, the vaccine. So this is an all of government approach. Um, there is a, a program that's been set up called Operation Warp Speed that includes Dr. Collins, Dr. Fauci, um, his colleagues at NIH, the Department of Defense, um, as well as other members of HHS and FDA. Dr. Peter Marks from our Center for Biological Evaluation Research. Um, has been helping coordinate that, is working very closely with Dr. Fauci and his team. And we've created what's called a Gantt chart to look forward, what are the necessary supply chain issues, syringes, needles, et cetera, uh, depending on the various vaccines that are being developed, how many times they have to administer it, and the route of administration. So we've been leaning in on this supply chain to ensure that when a vaccine is ready to go, we will have the necessary supplies to actually administer it and operationalize the vaccination. Thank you. I have a couple more questions, but again, the clock's not visible there, so I suspect I've used up my time. I'll submit those in writing. Thank you, Senator Enzi. Uh, Senator Sanders. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and let me thank all of the panelists for the hard work they're doing and for being with us uh, today. Um, it is sad to say that we have a president of the United States, the leader of our country, who from day one downplayed uh, the dangers facing this country from the pandemic, uh, who told us that the crisis would be over in a few months, that we did not have to worry, who fired uh, those members of the government who wanted to act aggressively and among other things, at a time when we need international uh, cooperation, cut funding, for the World Health Organization. But let me uh, also say that I think we understand that facts are terribly important. Not everybody uh, that we don't fully understand 
uh, all of the ramifications of the COVID-19 epidemic. But let me ask Dr. <laughs> Fauci a few questions, if I might. Uh, for a start, uh, the official statistic, uh, Dr. Fauci, is that 80,000 Americans have died uh, from the pandemic. There are some epidemiologists who suggest the number may be 50% higher than that. Uh, what do you think? Um, I'm not sure, Senator Sanders, if it's going to be 50% higher, but most of us feel that the number of deaths are likely higher than that number because th given the situation, particularly in New York City, when they were really strapped with a very serious challenge to their healthcare system, that there may have been people who died at home who did have right. COVID who were not counted as COVID because they never really got to the hospital. So in direct answer to your question, I think you are correct that the number is likely higher. I, I don't know exactly what percent right. higher, but almost certainly it's higher. Dr. Fauci, let me uh, ask you this. Um, uh, in the terrible uh, pandemic of uh, 1918, the virus um, exploded in the fall. It came back with a vengeance. Are we fearful that if we don't get our act together, as bad as the situation is now, it could become worse uh, in the fall or winter? Well, Senator, thank you for that question. It's a frequently asked question. And I think that possibility does exist. However, and the reason I say that is that when you talk about, will this virus just disappear? And as I've said publicly many times, that is just not gonna happen because it's such a highly transmissible virus. And even if we get better control over the summer months, it is likely that there will be virus somewhere in this, on this planet that will eventually get back to us. So my, my approach towards the possibility of a rebound and a second wave of the fall is that A, it's entirely conceivable and possible that it would happen, but B, I would hope that between now and then, given the capability of doing the testing that you've heard from <clears throat> Admiral Jawa and the ability of us to stock up on personal protective equipment and the workforce that the CDC under Dr. Redfield will be putting forth to be able to identify, isolate, and contact trace. I hope that if we do have the threat of a second wave, we will be able to deal with it very effectively to prevent it from becoming an outbreak, not only worse than now, but much, much less. Okay, well, let me ask, uh, we've heard a lot of discussion about vaccines. Obviously, everybody uh, in Congress and in this country wants a vaccine. We want it as quickly as possible, as effective as possible. Uh, let me ask the uh, Honorable FDA Commissioner, sir, uh, if, God willing, a vaccine is developed and if we're able to produce it as quickly as uh, we all hope we can, I would imagine that that vaccine would be distributed to all people uh, free of charge or make sure at least that everybody in America who needs that vaccine will get it regardless of their income. Is that a fair assumption? Uh, Senator, um, I, I, I certainly hope so. Um, FDA is very committed to making sure that all populations in the United States, including those most vulnerable, are included in the clinical trials. And well, we that's, very not, much that's not we, what I'm asking. What I'm asking is if and when the vaccine comes, it won't do somebody any good if they don't get it. And if they have to pay a sum of money for it, in order to profit the drug companies, that will not be helpful. Are you guaranteeing the American people today that that vaccine will be available to all people, regardless of their income? Sir, the payment of vaccines is not a responsibility of FDA, but I'm glad to take this back to the task force. I share your concern that this needs to be made available to every American. Does anybody else want to comment on that? Mr. Toro, do you think we should make that vaccine when hopefully it, it is created available to all regardless of income? Or do you think that poor people and working people should be last in line for the vaccine? I'm sorry, Senator, were you asking me? Uh, yes, I was, sir. Yes, um, I was. No, I, I, I um, my office is 
one of the offices committed to serving the underserved, and we need to be absolutely certain that if a vaccine or an effective therapeutic or preventive is available, that it reaches all segments of society, regardless of their ability to pay or any other uh, social determinants of health that there may be. Good. So what you're telling the American people today that regardless of income, every American will be able to uh, gain access to that vaccine when it comes. They should gain access to it. I don't control, you know, I well, think- Well, you, you represent an administration that makes that decision. Uh, I, I will certainly advocate that everyone is able to receive the vaccine regardless of income or any other circumstance. Uh, let me just One switch to you. Time, Senator Sanders. All right. I'm sorry. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Those are important questions. I, I don't want to cut senators off, but and it's hard to see the, uh, the, the time clock, but if we could stay as close as possible to five minutes, then all senators can get their questions in. Thank you, Senator Sanders. Senator Burr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank our, our witnesses today for what you've done for the people in this country and their safety and people around the globe. Uh, let me ask you, Dr. Fauci, because you've been in the task force and uh, at a majority of uh, the press conferences, has anybody in this administration ever asked you or any member to take the foot off the gas of trying to find a, a cure or, or any type of countermeasure? No, Senator, not, not at all. As a matter of fact, uh, we at MIH, as you know, have been right from the very beginning uh, put our foot right on that accelerator in every aspect, including the development of vaccines and therapeutics. And as I described in my opening statement, we actually started that in January, literally days after the virus was known and its sequence was published. So, no, I have never been told by anyone to pull back on the uh, development of any countermeasure or any basic and research project that we've been involved in. Thank you, Dr. Fauci. This question is for Dr. Redfield. Uh, Dr. Redfield, we have authorized in this committee and appropriated out of Congress multiple times over the last few decades money for biosurveillance, and you talked about it. In the past uh, four years, from FY16 to FY20, it's been $23 million a year, and with the CARES Act, it's over a billion dollars in biosurveillance. We've seen the private sector go out and use data available to track the uh, progress and, and spread of, uh, of coronavirus around the world. Why has CDC not contracted with private sector technology companies to try to use their tools for biosurveillance? Senator, thank you for the question. Uh, this is a critical issue, as you know, and, and also uh, comes into one of the uh, core capabilities I talked about, data analytics and data modernization, which we're appreciative of the, the additional funding Congress has given. I can tell you that uh, this is under a critical review now. We do have uh, contracts with some of the private sector groups now to try to make uh, the type of availability of data that we've seen with Florida available in all uh, of our jurisdictions across the country and, uh, um, and, and, and in the process of making that happen. Dr. Redfield, in April of last year, uh, June of last year, we reauthorized the pandemic and all hazards legislation, which authorized at that time 30 new billets, 30 new employees at CDC specifically in surveillance. Now, I asked Dr. Shukit um, in March how many of those uh, 30 had been filled. She said zero. As of mid-April, zero of those 30 billets had been filled. How many of those 30 employees that this committee authorized CDC to bring on for biosurveillance have been filled today? Sir, again, thank you for the question. I know our staffs have been in discussion since Dr. Shuckett's uh, uh, testimony, uh, and I know we're uh, in the process of con continuing to try to figure out how to move that forward, sir. I can get back to you on it as I discuss what progress has been made since we had that discussion post her uh, hearing with you when the, you brought that uh, to light? Well, I, I brought it to light the, the 1st of March, and now we're in mid-May. So uh, I'm hopeful that we won't just talk about surveillance, we'll actually execute it, and we'll focus uh, uh, the unbelievable amounts of money that we've uh, provided for you, that they will show some, some benefit to the American people. Dr. Fauci, let me come back to you. Um, this is one of the fastest 
development timelines we've ever seen for vaccines. And the American people and hopefully uh, people around the world will be the beneficiary of what you, what you find and the eventual licensure of, of that product. What are the biggest unknowns with this particular virus uh, that can affect the development process? And Dr. Hahn, if you've got anything to add after that to this, please do. Dr. Fauci. Yeah, thank you very much, Senator Burr. Well, there are a couple of things that I think are inherent in all vaccine development. First of all, there's no guarantee that the vaccine is actually going to be effective. As you well know, because we've discussed this many times in the past, that you can have everything you think that's in place and you don't induce the kind of immune response that turns out to be protective and durably protective. So one, the big unknown is it will be effective. Given the way the body responds to viruses of this type, I'm cautiously optimistic that we will, with one of the candidates, get an efficacy signal. The other thing that's an unknown, that's of concern, but we'll be able to get around that by doing the tests properly, is that do you get an enhancement effect? Namely, there have been a number of vaccines, two in particular, dengue and respiratory syncytial virus. When the vaccine induces a suboptimal response and when a person gets exposed, they actually have an enhanced pathogenesis of the disease, which is always worrisome. So we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Those are the two major unknowns. Putting all those things together, Senator Burr, I still feel cautiously optimistic that we will have a candidate that will give some degree of efficacy, hopefully a percentage enough that will induce the kind of herd immunity that would give a protection to the population at home. Dr. Hahn, anything to add to that? Yes, sir, thank you for the question. The obstacles from a regulatory point of view, <clears throat> I think are being met by the um, the approach that's being taken out of HHS and led by Peter Marks, and that is a common preclinical development pathway so that we can appropriately assess one vaccine against the other, and then a master protocol that allows for a common control group and an assessment of very common endpoints. That'll let us be as efficient as possible for the development of vaccine. Uh, we will evaluate approximately 10 candidates preclinically and then in the phase one and phase two studies, and then take four to five into phase three studies um, in this HHS effort. So I think those are the obstacles that can be broken down to speed the development, but also allow us to ensure uh, safety and effectiveness. Mr. Chairman, yesterday the state of North Carolina started to uh, publicize the recovered numbers, those individuals who had coronavirus but have recovered. It's my hope that nationally we will start reporting the recovered numbers. I think that's important for the American people to hear. I yield back. Thank you, Senator Burr. Senator Casey. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the hearing as well as Ranking Member Murray. Mr. Chairman, I wanted to start today with um, a question regarding nursing homes. Uh, in particular, across the state like ours, we've had, as you might know, a high number of cases in Pennsylvania at last count, over 57,000 cases. The number of deaths have gone above 3,700. And of course, a lot of those deaths are in nursing homes. We're told that uh, nationally, more than a third, as high as 35% of all deaths have been in nursing homes, either the death of a resident of a nursing home or a worker. So I'm gonna start with today with a question for Dr. Redfield. Dr. When, when we consider this challenge in our, in our long-term care facilities, uh, when we look at the number of deaths in nursing homes, I think a lot of families want basic transparency. And that's one of the reasons why Senator Wyden and I sent you a letter uh, dated April the 2nd. It was directed to you as well as the uh, administrator of the Centers on Medicare Medicaid Services. Uh, Seema Verma. And in that letter, we asked for basic information about uh, what the administration was doing to track the outbreaks in nursing homes, to provide information, basic information, to families and, their, and, and residents, uh, the, the families of residents in nursing homes, certainly to the workers as well as to the community and public health professionals. Now, it took uh, you over about a month to respond to that. But in your response, you didn't give us any information about the timeline. These 
families need this information. And now we're told by the uh, CMS administrator, after pressing her, as Senator Wyden and I did, that this information may not be available until the end of May. Um, I need to hear from you today, why has there been a delay, a three-month delay in basic information uh, that families and, and people in, within a community need about the outbreaks in nursing homes, the number of cases, what is happening in nursing homes, Tell us when we're going to see that information. Well, thank you very much, Senator. And you've highlighted one of the great tragedies that we've all experienced together. Um, clearly, uh, the long-term care facilities have been particularly hard hit um, by this pandemic. Um, several things, uh, I know that, again, the CMS who has oversight, several things have been um, done, uh, and I can get back to you in terms of where they're at in terms of activation, but clearly all nursing homes now are required to report cases uh, in either their individuals that are patients there or, or, or staff to the CDC. Um, secondly, um, I know that PERMA uh, has put a, a policy in, in place that all nursing homes are required to notify their members of that nursing home, of the existence of COVID in that nursing home, will include family members. I just or verify in terms of when that's, if that's operational as of today or last week, but I will get back to you with that. Uh, one of the most important we have decided as we talk about the key in reopening, as Tony mentioned, we need most symptomatic cases, we need to be able to do the contact tracing. But the other thing that we really need to do is to do surveillance because uh, this virus does appear to have a high propensity for asymptomatic uh, infection, which means our traditional ways of identifying cases is, is going to be blunted. And so we're developing a national surveillance system. And, and first and most important in that is to do uh, uh, comprehensive surveillance in all the nursing homes in the United States. Uh, uh, CDC will, will be doing that uh, in partnership with the state and local territorial health departments. Um, I think HRSA is going to have the responsibility to do it within the inner city clinics that are selected and, and the Indian Health Service for the Indian Health Service clinics. But this is critical. Uh, we get in front of this and do comprehensive surveillance of everybody in these nursing homes. We've also done, you know, aggressive uh, outreach in all of them and in, in enhancing infection control procedures, et cetera. Uh, CDC has been out to, uh, up, up, help these nursing homes with that into the guidance along with the CMS. But I'll get back to you in terms of the time. I'm pretty confident they're already, it's already operational, but I, I need to double check just to make sure because I, I know SEMA has announced that uh, they're all reporting to CDC now any infection in workers or, or, or patients and that they are required now to notify other members in the nursing home as well as family members of them um, when COVID is in one of those. And I, Mr. Chairman, just have one question for Dr. Fauci. Doctor, I wanted to ask you, in your testimony earlier in response to a question by Senator Murray, you outlined a basic concern you have with regard to states reopening. Can you restate that for us? Yes. Uh, thank you, Senator Casey. Yes. My concern is that if states or cities or regions, uh, in their attempt, understandable, to get back to some form of normality, disregard to a greater or lesser degree the checkpoints that we put in our guidelines about when it is safe to proceed in pulling back on mitigation. Because I feel if that occurs, there is a real risk that you will trigger an outbreak you may not be able to control, which in fact, paradoxically will set you back, not only leading to some suffering and death that could be avoided, but could even set you back on the road to trying to get economic recovery, because it would almost turn the clock back rather than going forward. That is my major concern, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Much. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Casey. Senator Paul. Dr. Fauci. Dr. Fauci. Scientists have shown that uh, rhesus monkeys that are infected with COVID-19 cannot be reinfected. Several studies have also shown that plasma from recently infected coronavirus patients 
neutralizes the virus in lab experiments. In addition, infusion of convalescent plasma is based on the idea that recovering coronavirus patients are developing immunity and that it can be beneficial as donated. Studies show that the recovering COVID-19 patients from the asymptomatic to the very sick are showing significant antibody response. Studies show that SARS and MERS, also coronaviruses, induce immunity for at least two to three years. And yet the media continues to report that we have no evidence that patients who survive coronavirus have immunity. I think actually the truth is the opposite. We have no evidence that survivors of coronavirus don't have immunity, and a great deal of evidence to suggest that they do. The question of immunity is linked to health policy and that workers who have gained immunity can be a strong part of our economic recovery. The silver lining to so many infections in the meat processing industry is that a large portion of these workers now have immunity. Those workers should be reassured that they likely won't get it again instead of being alarmed by media reports that there is no evidence of immunity. You've stated publicly that you'd bet at all that survivors of coronavirus have some form of immunity. Can you help set the record straight that the scientific record, as it is being accumulated, is supportive that infection with coronavirus likely leads to some form of immunity? Dr. Fauci. Yeah, thank you for the question, Senator Paul. Yes, you're correct that I have said that given what we know about the recovery from viruses such as coronaviruses in general, or even any infectious disease with very few exceptions, that when you have antibody present, it very likely indicates a degree of protection. I think it's in the semantics of how this is expressed when you say, has it been formally proven by long-term natural history studies, which is the only way that you can prove, one, is it protective, which I said and would repeat, is likely that it is, but also, what is the degree or titer of antibody that gives you that critical level of protection, and what is the durability? As I've often said, and I again repeat, you can make a reasonable assumption that it would be protective, but natural history studies over a period of months to years will then tell you definitively if that's the case. And I think that's important because in all likelihood is a good way of putting it, the vast majority of these people will have immunity instead of saying there is no evidence. You know, the WHO kind of fed into this by saying no evidence of immunity. And in reality, there's every evidence stacking up. And in fact, a lot of the different studies have shown that it is very unlikely that you get it again in the short term. With regard to going back to school, one thing that was left out of that discussion is uh, mortality. I mean, shouldn't we at least be discussing what the mortality of children is? Um, this is for Dr. Fauci as well. You know, the mortality between 0 and 18 in the New York data approaches 0. It's not going to be absolutely 0, but it almost approaches 0. Between 18 and 45, the mortality in New York was uh, 10 out of 100,000. So really, we do need to be thinking about that. We need to uh, observe with an open mind what went on in Sweden, where the kids kept going to school. The mortality per capita in Sweden is actually less than France, less than Italy, less than Spain, less than Belgium, less than the Netherlands, about the same as Switzerland. But basically, I don't think there's anybody arguing that what happened in Sweden is an unacceptable result. I think people are intrigued by it, and we should be. I don't think any of us are certain when we do all these modelings. There have been more people wrong with modeling than right. We're opening up a lot of economies around the, around the U.S., and I hope that people who are predicting doom and gloom and saying, oh, we can't do this, there's going to be a surge, will admit that they were wrong if there isn't a surge, because I think that's what's going to happen. In rural states, we never really reached any sort of pandemic levels in Kentucky and other states. We have less deaths in Kentucky than we have in, a, in, an, in an average flu season. It's not to say this isn't deadly, but really outside of New England, we've had a relatively benign course for this virus nationwide. And I think the one size fits all that we're gonna have a national strategy and nobody's gonna go to school is kind of ridiculous. We really ought to be doing it school district by school district and the power needs to be dispersed because people make wrong predictions. And really the history of this when we look back will be of wrong prediction after wrong prediction after wrong prediction starting with uh, Ferguson in England. So I think we ought to have a, a little bit of humility in, in our 
uh, belief that we know what's best for the economy. And as much as I respect you, Dr. Fauci, I don't think you're the end all. I don't think you're the one person that gets to make a decision. We can listen to your advice, but there are people on the other side saying there's not going to be a surge and that we can safely open the economy. And the facts will t bear this out. But if we keep kids out of school for another year, What's going to happen is the poor and underprivileged kids who don't have a parent that's able to teach them at home are not going to learn for a full year. And I think we ought to look at the Swedish model and we ought to look at letting our kids get back to school. I think it's a huge mistake if we don't open the schools in the fall. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I respond to that even though there are only 32 seconds left? Uh, yes, and you might make it clear whether or not you suggested that uh, we shouldn't go back to school in the fall. Well. Uh, First of all, uh, Senator Paul, uh, thank you for your comments. I, I have never made myself out to be the end all and only voice in this. I'm a scientist, a physician, and a public health official. I give advice according to the best scientific evidence. There are a number of other people who come into that and give advice that are more related to the things that you spoke about, about the need to get the country back open again and economically. I don't give advice about economic things. I don't give advice about anything other and public health. So I wanted to respond to that. The second thing is that you use the word we should be humble about what we don't know. And I think that falls under the fact that we don't know everything about this virus. And we really better be very careful, particularly when it comes to children. Because the more and more we learn, we're seeing things about what this virus can do that we didn't see from the studies in China or in Europe. For example, right now, children presenting with COVID-19 COVID who actually have a very strange inflammatory syndrome, very similar to Kawasaki's syndrome. I think we better be careful if we are not cavalier in thinking that children are completely immune to the deleterious effects. So again, you're right in the numbers that children in general do much, much better than adults and the elderly and particularly those with underlying conditions. But I am very careful and hopefully humble in knowing that I don't know everything about this disease and that's why I'm very reserved in making broad predictions. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Paul and Senator Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Murray and our witnesses. Um, I want to try to cover a lot of territory in my five minutes, so um, I'd certainly be appreciative of concise answers. But I want to start with Dr. Redfield. Um, Dr. Redfield, do you think that the current testing protocols at the White House um, presents a model for uh, other essential workplaces. I'm sorry, uh, Senator, I, uh, you broke up at the beginning of your question. If you could just say it again, I'm sorry. Yes, Dr. Redfield, do you think that the testing protocols currently in place in the White House uh, present a model for other essential workplaces? Well, I think, uh, well, thank you for the question. I think one of the important things you bring up is the essential worker uh, uh, guidance that CDC put out. And I think uh, it was originally modeled, obviously, on healthcare workers, where there were significant healthcare shortages in individuals that were- In many workplaces, I'm asking you if you think that the White House protocols for testing um, are a model for other essential workplaces. I. I I would just say that I think uh, each workplace has to define their own approach to how to operationalize our. We had some considerable comment on the fact that OSHA has not stood up uh, an enforceable mandatory emergency temporary standard for uh, workers in all sorts of work settings. But that aside, um, would you say that the PPE rules that and protocols in effect right now in the White House? are a model for other essential workplaces? We would, um, my own view, would, would go back to the uh, um, guidelines that CDC has put out about essential workplaces for people, if they are an essential workforce, that they go in public, they maintain six feet distancing, and they wear face coverings. Okay. Um, uh, Admiral uh, Jawar, um, you have testified about uh, how far you've come with regard to uh, testing assessments. Um, I, I want to ask you if you believe that we already have a national testing strategy today that spans, um, uh, that spans from the nationwide 
testing needs assessment to the nationwide testing supply assessment and a strategy to fill that gap to uh, procure domestically uh, what we need in terms of bridging that gap with testing platforms, swabs, specimen collection media, and reagents, and the PPE uh, needed to conduct those tests. So thank you for that. Um, we do have a strategy that spans us at least to the, at least to the fall um, and beyond. As, as I mentioned, um, we're working individually with every state, and I think uh, Senator Paul is correct that uh, Kentucky, Wyoming, or New Jersey, Rhode Island are different, and there, there are vastly different testing needs. The East Coast will have multiples of testing versus other states, and we're working those indiv individually. Um, so, it, yes. so I know you testified earlier that not only are you working with the states, but you're working with every lab in every state to increase capacity. What about uh, working with those who would be the um, uh, those who would need testing to, say, reopen their school, uh, their university, uh, their business, um, each of them have identified what they think are their testing needs based on, uh, you know, guidance, not mandatory enforceable rules. But are you in contact at that level? Is your dashboard have uh, visibility at that lowest level, or are you mostly in contact with the states? and with the labs? So um, over the last few months, we've done a lot of the individual work at nursing homes, at meatpacking plants, at other, I mean, really down to the very granular level. Okay. Where we are right now, however, is we are really working with the state leadership, with the public health lab, the state epidemiologists, the shows, the state health officials, um, because they, they really need to understand what their sum is going to be in their state. Okay. And then, in the fund, and in the funding, we're asking very specifically um, in the CDC funding for specific plans for schools, nursing homes, underserved, et cetera. So I have two more uh, points that I'm going to make. I don't have time for questions. One is about the transparency of that needs assessment. Can the public see it? Can the state see it? Can the help committee members see it? Uh, is it publicly available? And secondly, the delivery of this supply is a critical issue. And it seems to me that the logistics for getting this out, uh, whether it's PPE, testing, or uh, medical equipment, is still extremely fragmented, leading to price gouging and many other inefficiencies. We need to stand up the full power of the Defense Production Act. Would you like me to comment on that, ma'am? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm happy to have you comment with the indulgence of the uh, chairman. We've gone over time. Um, and you uh, why don't you try to give us a, succinct, a succinct answer to the senator, please, Admiral Giroir. Uh, yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. Um, particularly for things like swabs and media, there is still a very, uh, I would say, non-mature industry within the country, and that's why We've, we've made the decision to procure that all centrally through December um, and then distribute that to the state because there are just too many small companies, too many, too many variables to control without a really heavy federal hand. Um, that's just an example of where we really moved into that and used the DPA for swab um, to help support American uh, industry. Um, in more mature aspects of the industry, like some of the large test producers, um, we feel that by helping direct them to make sure that the states get what they need in the right distribution, that we're not procuring them directly uh, by us. But again, we're going to be very evidence and data driven as we move on. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Senator Baldwin. Senator Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me begin by first thanking each of our witnesses today for their expertise, their dedication and their hard work. Dr. Redfield, I want to start with you. I am hearing from dentists all over the state of Maine that the fact that they cannot practice in our state, despite following very strict infection control protocols, is causing growing health problems. 
Dentists tell me that teeth with cavities that could have been filled are now going to need root canals. Teeth that could have been treated with root canals are now going to require extractions. People with oral cancers cannot get the treatment, the cleanings that they need before beginning their treatment. Dental health is clearly so important and Maine state officials, as well as our dentists, are seeking assistance in reaching the right decisions. 47 other states either have reopened dental practices or have a day sent for them to reopen. So my question to you is this. If dentists are following the American Dental Association guidelines, if they're instituting strict protective measures for their patients, their staffs, their hygienists themselves, and if they're closely examining and seeing a decline in the number of COVID-19 infections in their county, are these reasonable factors for states to consider in reopening the practice of dentistry? Yes, um, Senator, thank you for the question. Uh, you know, we've been uh, interacting and talking with dentists and, and working with uh, the state and local public health officials um, to uh, update our guidelines on reopening um, a variety of medical services, as you know. And I think uh, you raise a very important point, and I would, uh, would not disagree with what you said about uh, looking at the American Dental Associations as well as the reality of the outbreak in the area. But we are in the process of updating those di guidelines, and they will include um, direct um, guidelines for dental practices. Thank you very much, Doctor. Dr. Giroth and Dr. Hahn, recently there's been a significant demand for rem remdesivir, I may be mispronouncing it, which transitioned to receiving an emergency use authorization. Last week, Maine's two largest hospital systems contacted me with questions about how this therapeutic will be allocated going forward. HHS finally released a statement on Saturday about allocations going to states, interestingly, not directly to hospitals. But once again, the decision-making behind these allocations is very unclear. HHS and the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response say that each state is expected to receive an allocation, but no timetable has been provided. Beyond those who are being treated with this drug at Maine Medical Center through a clinical trial, I'm concerned that hospitalized patients in Maine will have little or no ability to be treated with this promising therapeutic for the foreseeable future. As this and more therapeutics and ultimately a vaccine come onto the marketplace, how can these allocation and distribution issues be resolved so that patient care is not delayed and so that it doesn't depend on which state you live in whether or not you're going to get access to these treatments and ultimately a vaccine. Senator Collins, uh, this, oh, go ahead, Admiral Joao. Well, go ahead, go ahead, Commissioner. Uh, Senator Collins, um, I think we completely agree with you that um, this has to be an evidence-based approach, uh, getting the medical therapeutics, vaccines, remdesivir, whichever it happens to be the, to the people in need. Um, I think we can all agree upon the fact that we learned a lot of lessons from the remdesivir situation. And of course, as you mentioned, that's being led by HHS um, and, um, and ASPR. Uh, what you've seen in the most recent announcement is that um, what the task force did was provide guidance to HHS regarding 
uh, where the uh, most significant outbreak of hospitalization uh, outbreak occurred and where those hospitalization, hospitalized patients were. Um, this represented about a quarter of the supply of drug that we have, and more will be allocated according to the methodology that gets drug to where those hospitalized patients are. I think valuable lessons can be learned and will be learned with respect to other therapies and to vaccines in particular, and we must incorporate those into our um, operational plans moving forward. Thank you, Doctor. Admiral, do you have anything to add? I'm over time, sorry. Thank you. If you have anything to add, if you do so for the record. No, ma'am. No, ma'am, I agree with the commissioner. Uh, it's it's uh, absolutely critical that it's evidence-based uh, based on the people who could benefit from it and also fair and just throughout our country. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Collins and Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to you and Senator Murray for convening this. Thank you to all of our witnesses for your service. This is obviously an exceptional uh, hearing today in that three of our witnesses are in quarantine. And so I just want to start by asking a pretty simple yes or no question that I think I know the answer to. Um, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Hahn, and Dr. Redfield, I'm correct that all of you are drawing a salary, as you should, during your period of quarantine. Is that correct? <laughs> Uh, Senator, uh, let me let me start off. I think we better be careful about the issue of quarantine. We are essential workers as part of the essential infrastructure, and we are, uh, uh, when needed, which is often, do our duties and our respective places at the White House. I was at the White House yesterday, uh, and I will likely even, perhaps, even be there today, and in my office at the NIH. So uh, it is not really, strictly speaking, the quarantine as we know it but it is performing our duties as critical workers. And I'd be happy to have my colleagues also respond to that. Senator Murphy, this is uh, Steve Hahn. Um, I agree with uh, Dr. Fauci. Um, and yes, I am drawing a salary and um, I have continued to work during my quarantine. Um, and as an essential worker, will participate in meetings face-to-face uh, -face when that attendance is uh, considered critical. My, my point here, listen, you all should draw a salary while you are taking precautionary steps because of the contacts you have made. Um, my point is that quarantine is relatively easy uh, for people like you and me. Um, we can still work and get paid. We can telework. But there are millions of other Americans uh, who work jobs that can't be performed from home or are paid by the hour. Um, and it's just remarkable to me um, that this administration has not yet developed a mechanism for states to implement and pay for a quarantine system that will work for all Americans. Your plan to reopen America requires states develop that plan, and yet my state has no clue uh, how to implement and pay for that system without help from the federal government, um, which leads me to my second question. Um, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Redfield, you've made news today by warning us appropriately of the dangers of states opening too early. Um, but as Senator Murray mentioned, this is infuriating to many of us because it comes hours after the president declared that we have prevailed over coronavirus, which I'm just going to tell you is going to make it much harder on state leaders to keep social distancing restrictions in place. It comes days after the president called on citizens to liberate their states from social distancing orders. And I think you're all noble public servants, but I worry that you're trying to have it both ways. You say that states shouldn't open too early, but then you don't give us the resources to succeed. You work for a president who is frankly undermining our efforts to comply with the guidance that you've given us. And then the guidance that you have provided is criminally vague. And I wanna ask my last question on this topic. Um, obviously, the plan to reopen America was meant to be followed by more detailed, nuanced guidance, right? What does a downward trajectory mean? What happens if the trajectory is downward in some settings, but upward in others? What happens if you reopen and then there's a spike in one location or another setting? And of course, you knew this because you developed this guidance, this, this additional guidance that is uh, site-specific, that frankly is helpful. Some of this is on the CDC website, but some of it is not. And we need it. 
My state needs it. We don't have all of the experts that you have, um, and so we rely on you. So reporting suggests, Dr. Redfield, that this guidance that was developed by you and other experts was shelved by the administration, uh, that it was um, uh, withheld from states and the public because of a decision made by the White House. So my specific question is, why didn't this plan get released? And if it is just being reviewed, when is it going to be released? Because states are reopening right now, and we need this additional guidance to make those decisions. Senator, I appreciate your question. Uh, clearly, uh, we have uh, generated a series of guidances, as you know, um, and as this uh, outbreak response has evolved from a, a CDC to an all-of-government response, as we work through the guidances, a number of them go for interagency review and interagency input to make sure that these guidances uh, are more broadly applicable for different parts of our society. The guidances that you've talked about uh, have gone through that interagency review. There are comments that have come back to CDC, and I anticipate they'll go back up into the task force for final review. But, but we're reopening uh, in Connecticut in five days, in 10 days. I mean, this guidance isn't going to be useful to us in two weeks. So is it this week? Is it next week? When are we going to get this expertise from the federal government? The, the other thing I will just say is that the CDC stands by to give technical assistance to your state and any state upon any request. Uh, um, I do anticipate this broader guidance, though, to be um, posted on the CDC website uh, soon. soon. I can't tell you soon, Date. but in, in, I can tell you your state can reach out to CDC and we'll give guidance directly to anyone in your state on any circumstance that your state desires guidance from. Soon isn't terribly helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Senator Cassidy. Hey, gentlemen, thank you very much for your service. And I will have a, a set of questions. So if your questions can be brief. I appreciate your answers could be brief. Dr. Hahn, um, in your testimony, you mentioned that uh, the testing for the populations in the vaccine trials now includes older Americans. Uh, I guess my question, though, is what about children? Does it include children? Does it also include the obese, the diabetic, the immunocompromised, those who are at risk of having a less uh, a non-response or a mitigated response to vaccination? Uh, can you comment on that, please? Yes, sir. Um, thank you, Senator Cassidy. Um, when the phase two, phase three trials um, are in place, they will include our most vulnerable populations, including the individuals that you described. We're working very closely with so Dr. If I, Fauci. If I can interrupt, phase two is yes, normally check for safety. You would not have to do a separate phase two in the patient who was younger. Uh, you follow what I'm saying, or can you just assume the safety data from the adults applies to that of the children? So, no, we, we would also want to assess safety, sir, as well um, in children. So the current phase two trials, do they include children? They're in phase one studies right now, sir. Uh, well, two I thought that Fauci said we had a phase two going on. Well, I think it's about to start from the Moderna no. vaccine. Perhaps, Dr. Fauci, you can answer that. Yeah, I, no, Senator Cassidy, no, I, I did not say a phase two. As I said, we are in the second dose of the phase one, and we will proceed when we finish with phase one to go into phase two. So, we are not so, in phase two so I think I'm hearing that children will be included in phase two trials? No. The, the that's way, a, that, so that's under discussion between uh, FDA and NIH at this time, sir, because we do realize that it's important uh, for great. us to understand what this is in children. Uh, but Dr. This, Dr. Redfield, um, uh, the build back upon what <laughs> Senator Murphy said, uh, the published guidelines for schools, school opening, obviously you're about to modify, but I notice as I read through them, there's nothing about testing. So we speak about testing, targeted testing, how we use testing, but the guidelines for the school systems has nothing about how to integrate testing. Uh, will these be in those guidelines that are being released? Senator, thanks for the question. Um, Clearly, there's going to need to be, as already been stated, an integration of a testing strategy um, that is going to be different, I think, for different school settings, as well as different jurisdictions where there's schools or setting. Um, and that is going to um, have to be integrated into each of those. There's a general overarching guidelines. And then, as I say, I do think the testing strategy, which is important, is including the surveillance strategy. 
uh, uh, needs to be a uh, individualized. No, let me uh, let me let me comment on that, Dr. Redfield. Dr. Redfield, in all due respect, I think children, whether you're rural, frontier, suburban, or urban, is the one setting in which there is a remarkable commonality. And, and I will echo what Senator Murphy said. The resources that the federal government has greatly exceeds all but the most sophisticated, populous, wealthy state. And even then, it exceeds it by some extent. So I do think it would be good to have, okay, in a primary school setting, this is best practices, or these are three options, and choose between one of these three, to say to each school district or each private or parochial or independent school, work with your State Board of Health, figure it out, seems a wasted effort. I say that because children play such a role in both protection of disease, the spread of disease, et cetera. So your thoughts on that? Because it really seems that's the one setting where you can have, you know, not cookie cutter, but certainly a pattern which can be followed. Senator, I, I must have been misunderstood. When I was talking about differences, I was thinking of the difference between an elementary school, a high school, a college, uh, in terms of how we, a trade school, there may be differences in how you integrate a testing strategy. But I do think having a testing strategy with different options for people to evaluate based on different principles will be important in terms of the guidance. Dr. Fauci, um, you persuasively argue that the um, uh, risk of reopening prematurely is great. But I think the frustration, if I think of children in particular, the, the, the risk-benefit ratio of a child being at home, potentially away from enhanced nutrition, without the parent able to work because school, school provides daycare, without the monitoring as sometimes occurs for incidences such as uh, child abuse, but perhaps most importantly for all children, the opportunity cost of a brain which is forming, not having access to the information that will help that brain form optimally. Now, has there been any sort of kind of risk-benefit ratio for the child? Yes, they are at risk for Kawasaki's, but they are a particular risk for missing out on a year of education, particularly for those from less than rich backgrounds. I guess I'm very concerned about that tension. What are your thoughts on that? No, you, you make a very good point, Senator Cassidy. That obviously very difficult of the unintended consequences of trying to do something that broadly is important for the public health and the risk of having a return or a resurgence of an outbreak and the unintended deleterious consequences of having children out of school. We fully appreciate that. I don't have an easy answer to that. Uh, I, I just don't. I mean, we just have to see on a step-by-step -step basis as we get into the, the period of time with the fall about reopening the schools exactly where we will be in the dynamics of the outbreak. I might point out something that I think has been alluded to throughout some of the questions that we have a very large country and the dynamics of the outbreak are different in different regions of the country. So I would imagine that situations regarding school will be very different in one region versus another so that it's not going to be universally or homogeneous. But I don't have a good explanation or solution for the problem of what happens when you close schools and it, it, it triggers a cascade of events that could have some harmful circumstances. I, I, uh, for, I've, m Mr. Chairman, I, I'll close by asking the permission of the, uh, of the chair to submit for the record an article that just came out in the Journal of Pediatric Nursing, uh, Children Are at Risk from COVID-19. It would be I so yield. ordered and it will be included. Thank I you, yield. Senator Cassidy. Senator Warren. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. I uh, hope everybody's staying safe and healthy. Um, in the past 16 weeks, over 1.3 million Americans have been infected with coronavirus. We now know that about 80,000 people have died and 33 million people are out of work. Dr. Fauci, you have advised six presidents. You have battled deadly viruses for your career. So i just like to hear your honest opinion. Do we have the coronavirus contained? Uh, Senator, thank you for the question. Uh, right now, it, it depends on what you mean by containment. If you think that we have it completely under control, we don't. I mean, if you look at the, the dynamics of the outbreak, we are seeing a diminution of 
hospitalizations and infections in some places, such as in New York City, which has plateaued and started to come down, New Orleans, but in other parts of the country, we are seeing spikes. So when you look at the dynamics of new cases, even though some are coming down, the, the, the curve looks flat with some slight coming down. So I think we're going in the right direction, but the right direction does not mean we have by any means total control of this outbreak. So the right direction, as I understand it, we have about 25,000 new infections a day and over 2,000 deaths a day. I, I think those are the right numbers and some are estimating we could be at 200,000 new cases a day by June. Is that right, Dr. Fauci? Uh, I, don't, I don't foresee that as 200,000 new cases by June. I am hoping and looking at the dynamics of things starting to flatten off and come down that we will be much, much better than that, Senator. I mean, I but think that's really right now, just, just so I understand, we are right now at 2,000 new infections a day and uh, 25,000 new infections a day and 2,000 deaths a day. Right. And that's where we are right now. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So, so let me just ask, it, 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 we know that it is possible to get this virus under better control. Other countries have done it like South Korea, but we are now three months into this pandemic and basically we've continued to set records for the number of people who are diagnosed and the number of people who die. Dr. Fauci, you recently said that a second wave of coronavirus in the fall was, quote, inevitable, but that if America, quote, puts in place all of the countermeasures that you need to address this, we should do reasonably well. And the countermeasures you identified are things like uh, continued social distancing, significantly more testing, widespread contact tracing. You also said that if America doesn't do what it takes, and this is your quote, we could be in for a bad fall and a bad winter. So right now we're about 16 weeks away from Labor Day. That's about the same length of time since the virus was first detected here in the US. Do we have enough robust countermeasures in place that we don't have to worry about a bad fall and winter? Uh, right now, the projection, as you've heard from Admiral Giroir, with regard to testing and other elements that would be needed to respond, the projection is that by the time we get to the end of the summer and early fall, that we will have that in place. That okay. is the projection that I get. From. We, we don't have it in place now, but we are projecting that we'll have it in place. And let me just ask the other side of this, if we don't do better on testing, on contact tracing, and on social distancing, will deaths from coronavirus necessarily increase? Uh, of course, if you do not do an adequate response, we will have the deleterious consequence of more infections and more deaths. And that's the reason why you quoted me, Senator, quite correctly in everything you said and I will stand by that. If we do not respond in an adequate way when the fall comes, given that it is without a doubt that there will be infections that will be in the community, then we run the risk of having a resurgence. I would hope by that point in time, in the fall, that we have more than enough to respond adequately. But if I, we don't, there will be problems. I appreciate your hope, and I wish we could tell the American people that the federal government has this pandemic under control, but we can't. In fact, you have said that the virus is not under control in the US. We haven't yet taken the measures necessary to prevent a second wave of death. And we all know that the people who are gonna be most affected are going to be seniors, essential workers, uh, the people who are out on the front lines. The president, needs to stop pretending that if he just ignores bad news, it will go away. It won't. The time for magical thinking is over here. President Trump must acknowledge that the federal response has been insufficient and that more people are dying as a result. We are running out of time to save lives and we need to act now. So thank you, Dr. Fauci, for all you're doing. I appreciate it, but the urgency of the moment could not be clear. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Warren. 
Senator Roberts. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks to all the witnesses. Uh, you all are like the, uh, the Fab Four. Uh, I guess it was a Fab Five back in the day, but we're shining the light of truth in the darkness with individual uh, flashlights for sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for emphasizing that we have to be bipartisan in this approach or we're not going to get anywhere. And that obviously is in the eyes of the beholder. I'm happy to say that we have a very good relationship with Governor Kelly, who happens to be a Democrat, obviously, and a Republican. And her, emer her emergency management team is spot on. Uh, Dr. Lee Norman's doing an outstanding job. That's the rest of it. Uh, this morning I talked to Lee. The situation in Kansas is not very good. I'm reading here. Kansas receives 7,000 new uh, COVID tests for counties with food processing uh, facilities. Uh, you see this mural behind me. That's a stagecoach coming into Dodge as opposed to getting out of Dodge. Dodge City is my hometown. And we are the hot spot in regards to Kansas mainly because of two packing plants. We have five. That's 26% uh, of the cattle market. At any rate, Kansas is going through a tough time. It, 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 we shouldn't be worrying about the safety uh, of the food, but the food supply chain I think nationwide is under a great deal of stress. We see that in dairy, we see that in poultry, we see that in pork, they're euthanizing pigs uh, and, off, and obviously the livestock industry. Sonny Purdue with the Department of Agriculture has uh, stepped up, so has the president, uh, declaring that these uh, packing plants are uh, a national asset. We progress, uh, Dodge City, when we first started out, had five tests, five. That's between four and six, five. It's not 50 million as we hope to receive uh, uh, that has been said by um, one of the witnesses. Uh, the reason I'm really harping on all of the problems we're having in agriculture on top of the fact that the uh, relationship with China is such that even that first breakthrough with regards to trade to China seems to be on hold now. And that's another price depressant, and this is going on five or six years where our prices have been uh, below the uh, cost of production. In result, our consumers are really figuring out that food doesn't come from grocery stores. And I'm very worried that the uh, harm to the food uh, value chain is, uh, uh, is very real, not to mention the financial situation that our farmers, ranchers, and our growers all face. Now, having said all that, I want to ask uh, Admiral uh, Gerard, you've spoken about the importance of having diversity in kinds of tests that are available. Uh, the five packing plants we have in Kansas, if we could get a rapid test and we could get it uh, as we uh, hopefully ask for because of the hot spots that are developing, not only in Kansas, but also doing great harm to the food value chain, that would be absolutely wonderful. Would you speak to that, sir? Yes. Uh Thank you, Senator. Uh, both uh, Dr. Redfield and I have been very actively involved uh, in uh, getting strategies for uh, the industry, particularly in Kansas. Um, we are supplying uh, very heavily the public health labs with rapid diagnostics, as well as uh, surging them to, to areas like that. The, the one trade-off, however, is that the rapid, the quote, rapid point of care diagnostics are very slow. So each machine can only do four per hour, and that's very, very slow. So it's a mix of testing that you need at these kinds of situations. Um, uh, sort of the, the high throughput tests that are available at a major lab, a Quest lab right there in Kansas, um, as well as uh, a mix of the rapid uh, uh, testing, and that's what we're supplying in order to provide a comprehensive holistic solution um, and I, I believe CDC is on the ground uh, as well in Kansas supporting that. I appreciate that. If you're only doing four an hour, that's not a rapid test. Maybe it's a rapid slow test. I'm not quite sure how you define that. But um, I, for one, think that as we reopen, and by the way, uh, Governor Kelly started the opening process the first of this month, then there's May 18, uh, and then we go to June, and then the hope is we can open up. But, we do have contingency plans that if that doesn't work, as uh, aptly described by uh, 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 Dr. Fauci, uh, I, I, I think we'll be all right. But this is gonna be a tough go. I, I 
I have to tell you that in terms of agriculture, we're not in good shape. I appreciate everybody uh, and the job that you were doing. Uh, we'll stand beside you when you're taking the booze and behind you when you're taking the bows. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Kane. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, to the committee leadership and witnesses for calling this important hearing. The last time Dr. Fauci and Han were before us was March 3. I have a slide that I want to put up that shows what's happened in America since then. The chart, uh, which is here, compares the experience of the United States and South Korea on three dates. On January 21, both nations experienced their first case of COVID-19. At that time, the unemployment rates in both countries were essentially identical. On March 3, when the witnesses were last here, South Korea had experienced 28 COVID-19 deaths and the U.S. had experienced nine. Again, the economies of both nations as measured by the unemployment rates were nearly identical. But now the story changes. As of yesterday, more than 81,000 Americans have died and the U.S. economy has experienced job losses not seen since the Great Depression. Meanwhile, the economy of South Korea has not changed dramatically at all and the death toll is now at 256. South Korea is smaller than the United States, one-sixth of our population, but even if you bulk up the death toll to reflect the difference, the per capita death toll in the U.S. is more than 45 times the rate in South Korea. And the healthcare carnage here is causing a near depression while South Korea has protected its economy by managing correctly. I could have done this chart with other nations. The U.S. has the seventh highest per capita death rate in the world. Our death rate is off the charts higher than that in India, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and Mexico. It's nearly three times the death rate in Germany, twice as high as Canada's rate. The question is why. If we want to open up our economy and schools, we have to learn the lessons of nations that have managed this well. Here are some things that don't explain the difference. Our hospitals are as good or better than those in South Korea. Our healthcare providers, heroes, are as good or better than those in South Korea. Our research capacity is as good or better than South, that in South Korea. And we have more resources than South Korea. Our GDP is 12 times South Korea's and our per capita income is 50% higher. So to Dr. Fauci, the death roll in the United States, the death rate in the United States, especially when compared with other nations, is unacceptable, isn't it? Excuse me, sorry, sir. Uh, yes, of course. I mean, a death rate at that high is something that in any manner or form, in my mind, is unacceptable. And, and Dr. Fauci, the experience of other nations shows that the U.S. death rate is not only unacceptable, but it's unnecessary. Isn't that correct? I don't, I, I don't know if we can say that, Senator. But would you I say mean, that the U.S. Well, has to do better? Of course, you always have to do better. I mean, as a and the, and, and the experience of South Korea shows that how a nation manages the health care crisis has a huge impact also it's an, on its economic condition. Isn't that the case? That is the case, sir. I, I understand where you're going with this, but I have to tell you there is a big difference between South Korea and the United States let, and, and the nature of the outbreak. And let, and, let we, me, and let me get to that. I want to get to factors that do explain the difference since we know it's not resources or our health providers. Uh, first is testing. South Korea began, began aggressive testing much earlier than the U.S. Now in the fifth month of the pandemic, we've surpassed South Korea in per capita testing. But in the critical month of March, South Korea was testing its population at a rate of 40 times the testing in the U.S. Um, Admiral Gerard, Dr. Gerard has set out the standard for us. When we get to September, he says the United States needs to do 40 to 50 million tests a month to be safe. Uh, that equates to about 1.3 million to 1.7 million tests a day. Yesterday, we did 395,000 tests. We've got a long way to go. A second factor is contract trace, contact tracing. South Korea embraced a rigorous contact tracing program right from the beginning. The United States still has not engaged in a national contact tracing program. Isn't that right? Would that be I Dr. Fauci question, or Dr. Redfield? Sir, I think that question would best be directed to the CDC and not the NIH. 
When the outbreak started, sir, we had a, an aggressive contact tracing program, but unfortunately, as the cases r rose, it went beyond the capacity and we went to mitigation. So we lost the, the containment edge clearly. That, that, and, and that was key to the economy as well, because South Korea did testing, contact tracing, protect, serve, isolate the sick, and then they didn't have to do the shutdowns, which helped their economy. Social distancing is a third factor. We've talked about it, but finally, the last one, healthcare systems. Would you agree with me that it helps keep people safer either from serious conditions or death from COVID-19 if they have access to health care? Yeah, yes, of course. Of, cor of course that's the case. In South Korea, 97% of the population have health insurance. In the United States before COVID-19, millions didn't have it and lacked access to health care. The massive job losses in the last months threatened to take health insurance away from millions more, and President Trump is doing all he can to dismantle the Affordable Care Act, which would take health insurance away from tens of millions more. Let's learn the lessons from those who are doing this right. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Uh, Thank can you. I make a clarification, please, Mr. Chairman? Uh, this is uh, Brett Giroir. I just wanted to clarify that I did project that we will have the ability to perform 40 to 50 million tests per month in, in, in that time frame. But I said, if needed that, that, at that time, I am not making a proclamation. Uh, we have to really understand what, where the epidemic is, what the community spread is, before we can estimate the number of tests that are needed. I was simply stating the fact that our combination of testing capabilities will be at that level, even barring um, new input from the NIH. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Kane. Senator McCluskey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and gentlemen, thank you for being here this morning virtually, but also for all you have been doing for these many, many months. Um, Alaska's doing okay right now from a numbers perspective, and quite honestly, we want to keep it that way because we know we have exceptionally vulnerable populations. We know we have a, a geography that is challenging. We know that we have facilities that are very limited. Uh, last hearing, we had an opportunity to hear from Dr. Collins and he shared uh, where they are with the RADx, and, and also spoke to RADx up, um, which was very interesting about what we can be doing in rural areas, but, but focusing on hot spots. And as I reminded him, we don't want to be a hot spot in Alaska. So every effort that we make to keep the virus out of, of Alaska is our lives that are saved. Uh, I, I educated him on the community of Cordova that is just getting ready to open its, uh, its uh, Copper River salmon fishery in two days um, and was able to share that they had had one worker tested positive as he was coming in from the lower 48 to come to work. The good news on that is that all the protocols that we had put in place seem to be working. Uh, the quarantine, the isolation, uh, not only for that individual but for Others that he had come in contact uh, were secure. So I want, I want to recognize um, the assistance that we have received from the administration. Uh, Dr. Eastman is in the state at this moment, the, the chief medical officer for the um, uh, Department of Homeland Security, going out to rural communities to really better understand our, our vulnerabilities. Uh, go to some of our fishing communities to, again, understand how we can successfully prosecute a fisheries when you have to bring workers in from the outside. Uh, we thank you for the assistance with regards to additional testing capacity. Uh, I've been in, in contact with our chief medical officer of the state this morning and the mayor of Cordova, just better understanding, again, do we have the tests that we need? What do we need on the ground? And uh, uh, one of the things that, that I would like to have clarified, and this is probably to you, Dr. Shiwak, because you have been so helpful in kind of shining the light on what we need to be doing in these rural areas. But so much of the focus has been on hot spots and responding to the hot spots. But how do you keep those rural, remote, small communities from becoming the hot spots in the first place? Are we doing enough? And right now, the strategy has been we just lock it off. The travel restrictions that are in place are, are apparently working, um, but they're also, they're also devastating our economy, whether it's tourism, 
uh, whether it's our, our resource industries or whether it's the potential for our fisheries. So, uh, Admiral, if you might speak to, to that aspect of it, and then I have a very important question as it relates to contract uh, contact tracing that I'd like to direct to either Admiral Gira or uh, Dr. Redfield. So, thank you, Senator. And, and as you know, um, you have an outstanding state health officer in Dr. Ann Zink. And we do. I've had the privilege of working with her um, uh, and you have a very good uh, protocol in, in trying to keep uh, Alaska safe by uh, isolation over a period of time when you come in. Um, as you know, we also work with uh, the state to meet your, your very challenging testing requirements because you can't really you know, send labs out a thousand miles away. So we put a real customized mix of point of care and also the Cepheid machines. I think we sent nine or 10 new to Alaska and about 50,000 tests, which is about four times than you've done to date collectively in order to provide that support. So um, again, I do think there's a comprehensive strategy that you do have, um, but again, the mitigation uh, is to the degree that you can, given the, the circumstances, the face masks, the hand washing, the hygiene, we understand fully the challenges, particularly in the fishing environment and the remote but all these have to come together, the testing, the tracing, uh, the mitigation, the hygiene factors uh, to try to keep uh, your community safe. And uh, we really understand culturally that many of your communities uh, were almost annihilated in the 1918 uh, influenza uh, pandemic. So, uh, and that memory is still very sharp and very hurtful to many of the citizens. So we want to do our best to assure them that we are giving them all the protection we can. So Admiral, let me, let me turn to Dr. Redfield because this relates to contact tracing. And I think that this is a very, very key part of how we move forward um, into getting people back to work, getting people back to school. Right now we have about 100 people that are involved in, in contact tracing in Alaska. That's clearly not sufficient. Um, there's been talk about a national strategy, but I think we recognize that we have teams in place, whether it's AmeriCorps, whether it's Peace Corps, whether it's our, our, our public health core. What more do we need to be doing to make sure that once you've been tested positive, you know then what happens after that? Who else needs to be brought into, into this? And I'm not convinced that we're focusing enough on that aspect of how we move to, to reopening if we haven't done the contact tracing. Thank you very much, Senator. I, I wanna just reemphasize what you said. I think contact tracing capabilities is, is critical. Uh, it's gonna be the difference from succeeding in, in, in containing this outbreak from once again causing wide scale community transmission uh, or not. Uh, we're positioned, as you know, uh, to deploy, uh, redeploy the number of CDC, over 500 CDC individuals. We have another over about 650 that we're trying to put in through our foundation. But most importantly, we're trying to work with your health department with the resources that, that we've been able to give because of the Congress supplementals. Also, as you mentioned, with these other agencies, with LabCorp, I mean, with uh, AmeriCorps, with the Census Bureau, uh, to work together and have the state develop their capacity. Some states have uh, reallocated state work. Some states have reallocated National Guard while they begin to do this. But I agree with you when I said it's going to be a, a, a significant effort to build the contact capacity that we need in this nation. It will be state by state, but it's going to need to be augmented uh, probably in your state from what you just said, at least uh, five to tenfold. Uh, and we're there to work with the states to help them get that accomplished. That needs to get in place before September. Uh, Dr. Fear, we need to move on to the next question. Thank you. And thank you, Senator Murkowski. I don't want to cut any senator off, but we have eight more senators who have five-minute rounds, and, and it's 12.30, so I'd like to request that the senators and the witnesses succinct questions and try to stay within five minutes would be appreciated. Uh, Senator Hassan. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you and the ranking member for having this hearing and thank you to our witnesses today. And please pass our thanks along to all of the hardworking women and men in your agencies who I know have been working 
uh, virtually around the clock uh, to try to uh, improve our response and keep Americans safe. And Mr. Chair, I hope you and all the witnesses are healthy and safe today, as is everybody on your team. Um, I wanted to start by echoing the comments my colleagues have made about needing leadership from the CDC and our public health experts on how we are going to use facts and evidence as guidance so that our schools and our daycares and our businesses have the information they need to create safe and sustainable plans to reopen. And of course, that means too that our testing capacity not only has to be enough, but it has to be flexible enough to meet our needs. Um, the key distinction between South Korea and the United States is not how many tests per capita over a certain amount of time we've done, but the fact that at the onset of this pandemic, South Korea was much more able to do a lot more tests per capita than we were, and then follow that with all the other measures you've talked about. So that we continue to need to identify the need and then build our capacity towards the need, not the other way around. Um, I wanted to start with a question to you, Dr. Fauci. First of all, thank you for your work and your expertise. I wanted to talk about nursing homes for a minute. In New Hampshire and across the country, a huge number of the deaths from COVID-19 that we are seeing have been in nursing homes. We all know people who have lost a friend or a family member in nursing homes and the grief compounded by the fact that people couldn't be at their loved one's bedside uh, if they died. Yesterday, Dr. Burks said that all 1 million nursing home residents should be tested within the next two weeks, as well as all nursing home staff. Dr. Fauci, as a short-term goal, that makes sense to me. But after that, what will the ongoing federal recommendations look like? How frequently do we need to test patients and staff on a continuing basis? And what other measures will be necessary to keep our loved ones in these facilities safe? Thank you for the question, uh, Senator Hassan. Um, the, the, the general plan, as you mentioned, that was recommended by Dr. Burks is a sound plan, as you said, uh, in the immediate. Question is, in the long range, we will have to have infection control capabilities in nursing homes that are really pristine and really unassailable. We'd have to do the kinds of surveillances and have to have the capability of when you identify someone, you get them out of that particular environment so that they don't spread the infection throughout. So general testing for all, I think is a good start, but when you look where you're gonna go in the future, there has to be a considerable degree of surveillance capability. Thank you, doctor. The White House is now requiring all staff to wear masks and anyone in regular contact with the president to be tested daily. Do you think nursing homes should implement those same measures to help make sure that our seniors can get the same level of protection? I think there should be a, 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 a system in place for the optimal protection of people in nursing homes. And that would be not necessarily testing every person every day. That's one approach that might not be practical when you think of all the nursing homes in the country. But very strict uh, regulations and guidelines about who is allowed to go into the nursing home. And the staff, I believe, needs to be monitored very carefully with intermittent testing to make sure that we don't have introduction into the nursing home of infected individuals. I'm not sure you can practically do it testing every day. That I don't think would be um, feasible, but something that is much more aggressive than has been done in the past, I believe should be done. Well, thank you. I have uh, one last question for Dr. Fauci and Dr. Redfield. I would also just say that if we are able to get masks to everybody in the White House, I hope we can get masks to every nursing home employee who needs it. Uh, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Redfield, the U.S. needs to be preparing now to ensure that we have capacity to manufacture and administer vaccines, something you've both touched on, both for an eventual COVID-19 vaccine, as well as other illnesses such as the flu. The failure to ramp up production of testing and personal protective equipment early on during this crisis made things worse here. And those mistakes can't be repeated when it comes to vaccine production and distribution. We are already seeing reports that some children are not receiving routine immunizations as it becomes more difficult to access in-person care. 
Dr. Fauci, what steps do we take now to ensure that we have sufficient manufacturing and distribution capacity for a COVID-19 vaccine without putting at risk our capacity to manufacture and distribute other important products such as the flu or measles vaccine? And my follow-up question to Dr. Redfield would be what efforts are underway at CDC to ensure that all routine vaccines are accessible during the COVID-19 public health emergency? Yeah, thank you for that question, Senator Hassan. I'll answer it as quickly as possible. I alluded to this in my introductory remarks when I was talking about vaccines for COVID-19. And what we said that as we do the testing on these vaccines, we are gonna make production at risk, which means we will start putting hundreds of millions of dollars of federal government money into the development and production of vaccine doses before we even know it works. So that when we do, and I hope we will, and I have cautious optimism that we will, ultimately get an effective and safe vaccine, that we will have doses available to everyone who needs it in the United States, and even contribute to the what is the needs globally because we are partnering with a number of other countries. The other part of your question about making sure that when we get into a situation like the so-called shutdown that we might be in now, that we make sure that children get the vaccinations that they need, because that would be an unintended consequence of shutting down as we are right now. It's a very good point, and we want to make sure we don't fall behind on that also. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'll take my answer from Dr. Redfield offline. Thank you so much for allowing me to vote. Thank you, Senator Hassan. <clears throat> Senator Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the panel. Thank you all for being here virtually. Without any question, we find ourselves in a situation that we wish we were not. And I'm very thankful for folks like Dr. Burks, Dr. Fauci, and many others for your dedication 24-7. Without any question, our nation is safer because of your hard work. I'm going to direct my questions towards Dr. Fauci, really one specific question, Dr. Fauci. And I'm thinking about the reopening of America, and specifically, the reopening of South Carolina. And I'm taking into consideration the fact that in South Carolina, I think overall our cases are moving in the right direction. We have a little less than 8,000 cases, unfortunately 350 deaths. Our hospital capacity is actually better now than it was when the pandemic started. Our ability to isolate hotspots and mitigate the spread of the virus is, I think, where it needs to be. With that in mind, I flew into Washington from South Carolina yesterday, uh, we have plans to test additionally 220,000 more residents by the end of this month, focusing on at-risk populations. By the end of this month, we will have tested 100%, 100% of nursing home residents and the staff that takes care of them. And after increasing our contact tracing workforce 20-fold in the matter of weeks, our state's health department announced yesterday that we're going to increase it by an additional 1,400 contact tracers. We have built and we continue to build the tools necessary to better detect and isolate cases, to map their exposure, and to prevent substantial spikes moving forward. Most importantly, our health care system, thanks in part to flexibilities from this administration, has the beds and the equipment necessary to address the most serious cases when they arise. Now, with these tools in hand, we have begun to reopen. To be clear, we continue to scale up testing and to, make, to take measure to protect the most vulnerable. And the data points are increasingly clear. For older Americans and for those with chronic conditions like diabetes and high blood pressure, this virus remains a threat, a dangerous threat. A recent report suggested that in New York, roughly 90% of the fatalities had underlying issues. Two-thirds of fatalities were 70 years or older, 95% over the age of 50. In South Carolina, the median age of patients who have died from the virus, 76 and a half. Nearly two-thirds of fatalities have been patients older than 71, and nearly 90% were over the age of 60, and roughly 98% in South Carolina are over the age of 50. Contrast that with those age 20 and younger, where we've seen no deaths. Fewer than 1% of deaths in my state have been under the age of 40. Every single death is a tragedy, every single one. And we mourn with our family members who've lost their loved ones. 
We are taking every measure to protect our older South Carolinians as well as those with underlying conditions. But when we set out to flatten the curve by taking aggressive, unprecedented measures like staying at home uh, orders and mass small business closures, we didn't set out with the goal of preventing 100% fatalities. That would be unrealistic. It is impossible. And we didn't set out to keep quarantines in place until we found a safe and effective vaccine. That would take too long. Dr. Redfield, your agency put out a helpful graphic showing two curves, one which spiked quickly and peaked high, reflected daily cases without protective measures. The other, flatter curve, showed cases with those measures in place. And the whole point, which the graphic illustrated, was to make sure that we did not exceed hospital capacity. So, while I respect the need for caution, we are too often presented with a false dichotomy either saving our economy or saving lives. We've seen the goalposts around flattening the curve move, and I think that's unfortunate. Because at the same time we're doing that, businesses have collapsed. Mental and physical health have declined. Depths of despair escalate. Educational outcomes nosedive as we wait in our living rooms, praying for some good news around therapies and around vaccines. We set out to flatten the curve, and I think we've done a pretty good job of that. We need to do better, and we will do better. My question, Dr. Fauci, is as we start the process of moving towards uh, reopening South Carolina, what else would you suggest that we could do to protect our most vulnerable populations? Thank you, Senator uh, Scott. Uh, you gave a really very eloquent uh, description of what I think is one of, would be a model way, the way you approach this. I mean, you have put things in place that I think would optimize your capability of reopening. And I was, as I was thinking, as you were speaking, I'd almost want to clone that and make sure other people hear about that and see what, what you've been doing. The issue of your direct question to me about the vulnerable populations is that, as we have said in our guidelines, and it looks like you are ready to progress carefully because you put into place a very good system that the vulnerables, the elderly and those with underlying conditions should be those who at the very last uh, uh, lifting of mitigations should be those who are left in a situation where they might be in danger of getting infected. In other words, protect them right up until the very end of the relaxation of your mitigation. Because as you said very correctly, those are the individuals that are the most vulnerable to the morbidity and the mortality. So those are individuals, particularly I might say, sir, those in the minority group, the African-American and Hispanics, who for a variety of, 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 of situations that are the social determinants of health, have a greater likelihood of not only getting infected, but of also having the underlying conditions that would make their risk for a high degree of morbidity and mortality higher. So it looks like you're doing things very, very well, and I would encourage you to continue and to follow the guidelines as you get closer to normalizing your state. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Fauci, and I'll just simply close with this since I'm out of time. Thank you for the many conversations that you and I have had about those vulnerable populations to include minorities as well as our senior citizens. I will say that without any question, when you look at nursing homes, it's typically African Americans and Hispanics are the certified nursing assistants who are providing care for the elderly population. So your focus uh, on those two very vulnerable groups is much appreciated, and thank you for your expertise. Thank you, Senator Scott and Senator Smith. Thank you so much, Chair Alexander and Ranking Member Murray, and uh, thanks to all of you for being here today and for your service. Um, Dr. Fauci, I have to say you are in the unenviable position of being the person that so many Americans and Minnesotans trust to give us the straight scoop and tell us what's really happening. Um, you're about the facts and not about the politics, and that's a really good thing. Uh, so I, I have to start by asking a question that I think a lot of a lot of Americans want to know, which is, how are you doing? How are you holding up? You've, hmm. It's been an unbelievable yeah, effort. I'm doing fine, uh, Senator. Thank you very much for asking. This is, this is a, such an important problem. It, it transcends all of us individually and has to be working as a team. 
and, and I, I enjoy very much working with your senators and the governors because it's at the local level that we're going to make this thing work. So I'm fine. I appreciate your concern. Well, a lot of people are thinking about you and are grateful for your service, as are, we are for all of you. Um, you know, so we're gathered today to think about what we need to do to reopen our economy. And I think first about what's happening in my home state of Minnesota, where agriculture is such an important part of how our state works. It's a part of our history and our culture. Um, pork processors right now are looking at the reality of euthanizing thousands of hogs a day um, because there is no place to process them because of what's happening in the processing plants. And the working people who do the hard work in those processing plants are getting sick. So here's one story. This is a one worker, um, the Star Tribune wrote about this, um, named uh, Homare de Jesus. She's an asylum seeker and a mom who works for a contractor that does the cleaning and the processing plants. And she works for $14 an hour, seven hours a day, five days a week. And her job is to sanitize the machines that process the, uh, the meat into a uh, ground meat. And she started feeling sick on April 11th, but she kept going to work. And on April 21st, when one of her coworkers fainted, uh, she told her supervisor that she felt sick. And so she was told to go home, but that if she didn't show any signs of illness, she should come back. Uh, she went to the doctor and she paid $115 to get a test and found out a few days later that she was COVID positive. And she's still at home. She's still, she's not getting paid. Um, and she doesn't have health insurance. And nearly two weeks ago, President Trump deployed the Defense Production Act to keep these processing plants open. But the USDA gave really limited guidance about what would be safe for those workers. It said, for example, in response to testing, which has been such a big part of what we've been talking about today, they said, this is a quote, Facilities should consider the appropriate role of testing in workplace contact tracing of COVID-19 positive workers in a worksite and assessment. So Dr. Fauci, as we think about how we move forward, we all want to open up the economy. What, what guidance would you give us in a situation like this here in Minnesota? Well, uh I can give you my common sense guidance, although this is not the area of my expertise. It's more in others, but it would seem that if you want to keep things like packing plants open, that you really got to provide the optimum degree of protection for the workers involved, the ability to allow them to go to work safely, and if and when uh, individuals get infected, to immediately be able to get them out and give them the proper care. So I would think when you're calling upon people to perform essential services, you really have almost the moral responsibility to make sure they're well taken care of and well protected. And again, that's not an official proclamation. That's just me speaking as a physician and as a human being. Well, thank you, Dr. Fauci. And I think that uh, you speak as a human being, but you also speak as the chief epidemiologist of our country and the person that we all trust. And this is the point that I want to I want to make and drive home with everybody, which is this is the kind of guidance that we should be getting and following. And then this is the kind of these are the tools that we we have got to have in our country if we are going to reopen our economy as we all want to do. And um, this, it, it, we move forward with reopening our economy, and yet we still have circumstances like we have in these processing plants um, and in other places around the state. We are going to be. Um, we're going to be right back where we started, and except even in a worse place, as I think you've pointed out, Dr. Fauci. But thank you, Senator. Uh, and, and again, it really does relate to one of the questions that one of yes. your colleague senators asked me before, that one of the things that I keep emphasizing, and I'll just repeat it again because it's important, that when you are in the process of opening up and pulling back on mitigation, you really must have in place the capability of responding when you do have the inevitable upticks in cases, that will absolutely occur. It's how we deal with it and how successful we are in putting the clamps on it that will prevent us from getting the kind of rebound that not only from the standpoint of illness and death would be something that's unacceptable, but it will set us back in our progress towards reopening the country. Thank, Thank you very much, Senator Smith. 
Uh, Senator Romney. The sharing and the participants uh, in it. Uh, uh, Admiral Giroir, I'm gonna take off where uh, Senator Hassan uh, uh, spoke. I understand that politicians are gonna frame data in a way that's most positive politically. Uh, of course, I don't expect that from admirals, but yesterday you celebrated that we had done more tests and more tests per capita even than South Korea. But you ignored the fact that they accomplished theirs at the beginning of the outbreak while we treaded water during February and March. Uh, and, uh, and as a result, uh, by March 6th, the U.S. had completed just 2,000 tests, whereas South Korea had conducted more than 140,000 tests. So partially as a result of that, they have 256 deaths and we have almost 80,000 deaths. I, I find our testing record nothing to celebrate whatsoever. Uh, the fact is their test numbers are going down, 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 down now because they don't have the kind of outbreak we have. Ours are going up, up, up as they have to. I think that's an important lesson for us as we think about the future. Uh, on, a, on a separate topic, uh, uh, my impression is that with regards to vaccines, the, the, where I'm critical of what we've done on testing on vaccines, we've done a pretty darn good job of moving ahead pretty aggressively. And, and yet the president said the other day that President Obama is responsible for our lack of a vaccine. He, uh, Dr. Fauci, um, is President Obama or, or by extension, President Trump, did they do something that, that made the likelihood of creating a vaccine less likely? Are, are either President Trump or President Obama responsible for the fact that we don't have a vaccine now? Or, or in delaying it in some in some way? No, no, Senator, not, a, not at all. Certainly, President Obama nor President Trump are responsible for our not having a vaccine. Uh, we moved, as you said, because I described it in my opening statement, rather rapidly, no one has ever gone from knowing what the virus was to a phase one trial as fast as we've done. So I don't think that's something that one should say anybody's responsible doing anything wrong on that. I think that's right. That's the correct way to do it. Thank you. That, that was my impression. I was surprised by the comment, but that was my impression. Uh, Dr. Redfield, uh, Senator Sinema and I wrote a letter to you expressing our dismay at the lack of real-time data at the CDC. I'm talking about granular, demographic, hospitalization, treatment data. H how is it possible in this day and age that the CDC has never established such a real-time system with accurate data. And, and what can Congress do to rectify that so we never have to look at something like this again? There you go. There you go, I'm sorry. Senator, thanks for the question. I think you've hit one of the important they are. The first one I focus on is data, data modernization, data analytics, and predictive data analysis. Clearly, Congress uh, has a forward in providing funding for data modernization, um, and we're in the process of implementing that. But there, the reality is there, there is uh, an archaic system, uh, a non-integrated public health system. Uh, each public health department has their own systems. Uh, this nation needs a modern, highly capable uh, data analytic system that can do predictive analysis. I think it's one of the many shortcomings that have been identified as we went through this uh, outbreak. And uh, I couldn't agree with you more. It's time to get that correct. Thank you. Please help guide us as to what we need to do to make sure that happens. And I presume it's not build it ourselves, but work with companies that have that capacity and use that capacity uh, in, in our favor. Dr. Fauci, one, one last thing which, which relates to a virus, and I, I know I'm asking you the impossible question, but um, we're all hoping for a vaccine, <laughs> obviously. Uh, it's the objective of our administration to get it as soon as they can, and from what I can tell, they're pulling out all the stops to do exactly that. Um, uh, given our history with vaccine creation for other coronaviruses, um, how likely is it? I mean, is it extremely likely we're gonna get a vaccine within a year or two? Uh, is it just more likely than not, or is it kind of a long shot? Uh, it's definitely not a long shot, uh, Senator Romney. I would think that it is more likely than not that we will, because this is a virus that induces an immune response that people recover. The overwhelming majority of people recover from this virus. Although there is good morbidity and mortality at a level in certain populations, 
the very fact that the body is capable of spontaneously clearing the virus tells me that at least from a conceptual standpoint, we can stimulate the body with a vaccine that would induce a similar response. So although there's no guarantee, I think it clearly much more likely than not that somewhere within that time frame we will get a vaccine for this virus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield. Thank you, Senator Romney. I want to thank the witnesses for their patience. We have four more senators, and we'd like to give them a chance to ask their questions. So, Senator Jones. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to all our witnesses for your uh, being here virtually and also for your incredible service during this time. I want to follow up real quick with a, an additional statistic that Senator Romney talked about with regard to South Korea, uh, and that is uh, the fact that we are a nation that has about six times the population of South uh, Korea, but yet we have about 310 times the number of deaths from this pandemic. So I think we have to be very careful in making comparisons around the, the world, uh, comparing the United States to other countries. Uh, Dr. Redfield, I want to follow up just a little bit with what Senator Murkowski uh, and I think Senator Kane talked a little bit about contact tracing and where we're going. I understand that you are working with uh, states uh, to try to develop plans for reopening. Um, the testing is important. The contact tracing is important. But using that data as well is also going to be important in terms of the quarantine plans that Senator Murphy talked about, child care facilities to have allow people to put their kids uh, in a facility while they are still uh, go back to work. All of those issues, including maybe even facilities like vacant hotels or motels that may be used for self-isolation. How is this plan being developed within the CDC? Is the, are those plans going to be individualized by state? Uh, will we, as a member of Congress, be able to have access to those plans? Uh, and how, how are states going to pay for these? And I say that because my state's already using the money that we've already given them as a wish list. I mean, they're talking about building a $200 million state house as opposed to developing the test and doing the contact tracing. So I'd like for you just to drill down a little bit on how these plans are going to develop, what access we will have to the, have those plans and be able to see them. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, this is uh, obviously, as I said before, this is a critical component of us taking this time that we have now to get prepared for next fall and winter and building that comprehensive contact tracing capacity. We're working individually with the leadership of the state health departments, the local health departments, territorial and tribal, to try to let them um, get us to understand what they think their capacity needs are. And those discussions have already happened, as Admiral Girard said, there's been a variety of federal agencies together on testing and contact tracing. CDC's in position that we've reprogrammed our individuals that we have across the country, over 500, begin to help each of these states. We've augmented that with some additional personnel that we're bringing on board state by state through our foundation. We've moved about $106 billion of the money that Congress has appropriated into the states so they can begin to start thinking about how do they want to hire for a longer term contact tracing capability. And then, of course, it was mentioned that we're uh, other government programs like AmeriCorps, this is Peace Corps, so that each group is going to uh, construct uh, their contact tracing piece what they think their needs are. And I do think it is going to be similar to what we heard from the senator from South Carolina. These are significant increases. He said he increased 20-fold, and they're going to increase again. But the point you brought up is also critically important, and we found that as we already struggled through the repatriation of different Americans from around the country, where we had to put many of these in quarantine, as you know, that up using military bases because many of the state and local health departments really haven't developed that system. Where do they put somebody who to be in isolation who's homeless? How do you develop those systems? So this has to be part of it too. Is it there's, there's certain uh, capacity that's intrinsic or is it certain hotels, as you mentioned? I think the point that was made by one of the other senators is so important uh, about individuals that particularly, say the meatpacking individual that has to go home and self-isolate, 
but maybe they don't have ability to go home and self-isolate because they live in a multi-general general, uh, generation house with about 12 other people. So there has to be mechanisms to be brought in to actually have an effective way to identify cases, identify contacts, and then do the appropriate public health measure. And it does have to be comprehensive. It's going to be developed one jurisdiction at a, at a time. I see no reason why these are not uh, transparent documents as they get get completed. Uh, and it really is a tribute to what the congressional support that you have given uh, so far. As I said, $1.6 billion got into the state for them to begin to do this in addition to the resources that we've gotten. But it is fundamental. People underestimate how important it is that we have a highly functional, comprehensive, aggressive contact tracing program so that the next phase of this outbreak, we containment. We don't have to switch for mitigation. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Redfield. I appreciate it. It sounds to me like we still got a lot of work to do. So thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Jones. Senator Braun. Thank you, Chairman. Um, been so much discussion about testing in general. Uh, I've listened to uh, Senator Romney earlier. I think Senator Kane mentioned it. Um, everybody has. Uh, Dr. Hahn, if you remember when uh, we first met, I said, is the FDA going to be more entrepreneurial? Uh, is the FDA going to kind of not be as stodgy? Talking then about how we fix the healthcare system in general. Now this has brought it into clear focus. Um, I've got a timeline that I'm going to submit for the record that shows from January 24th through March 5th, and I want to emphasize what Senator Burr asked earlier, has the administration ever put an impediment in front of trying to get to testing? And Dr. Hahn, this will end up in a question in a moment, but there was a span of time from January 24th through March 5th that I hope the American public looks at. And it gets back to what's wrong with our healthcare system in general. Uh, early testing, from what I'm seeing, was created by the fact that uh, the CDC said it was going to do its own test. The South Korean test that gets cited so often was not going to be looked at. We had to do our own. I know the FDA worked with the CDC, but the uh, long and short of all of this is that for nearly a month, this was in that bureaucratic swirl. Uh, the FDA prevented private and academic development of tests for weeks. The CDC uh, denied access to functioning tests, as I cited, in South Korea. This created, through all the red tape and bureaucracy, to where we had to come up with a one-size-fits-all approach due to the uncertainty of the virus. And we are stuck with that now. I don't want to dwell on that necessarily because I think those were mistakes that we made. I'm tired of having it heard that it's the administration's fault. Uh, Dr. Hahn, I'd like to ask you this question. In that spirit of what we talked about uh, during your nomination process, here going forward, Will we shed some of that stodginess? Will we look to get therapeutics and vaccines through the system in a quicker method? Because I fear if we don't, and if we treat through bureaucracy how we did the early period of testing, we can belabor this into the distant future. And at that point, there, there's going to be not only the carnage from the disease itself, but from the economy to deal with. So I'd like your comment on that one month stretch, what accountability the FDA and the CDC have, and then whether it looks better in terms of moving more quickly into the future. Uh, thank you, Senator Braun, for the question. Um, our uh, timeline of that period demonstrates that we began working with test developers beyond CDC on January 24th and had double digit number uh, of test developers working with us. One of the issues that we identified was in fact availability of the virus um, and other supplies to actually get that test development uh, done in a timely fashion. Senator, I completely agree with you that this is an opportunity for us to take a look and determine how we can do things better. And I think that's a really um, important 
uh, thing for all of us to do. And certainly the FDA can promise you we'll do that. Looking forward, sir, um, I can commit to you that we will look at every one of our regulatory authorities. We have done so during this uh, outbreak. We have provided significant flexibility and have tried to provide the right balance between regulatory flexibility and enabling of the great test developers and therapeutic developers in this country with the need to ensure that our gold standard of safety and efficacy is in place. We have leaned in with manufacturers. We've learned a lot from them as well as the other stakeholders, and we will continue to learn. And we will, I commit to you, sir, implement the, the changes that are necessary to make sure that we can act in a more nimble way, but still protect the safety and efficacy of medical products. Thank you. Um, Dr. Fauci, uh, taking a page from your anti-AIDS playbook uh, that implemented a formal, clearly defined treatment review pathway, can we do that for COVID-19 in a similar parallel track that you put into place back then in the 90s? In fact, I've got a bill uh, called the Promising Pathways Act that is based upon that protocol you put into place. Can we do that to more quickly get through to therapeutics and vaccines here with COVID-19? Well, it's, it's a different story, uh, but some similarities. Uh, if you're referring to the parallel track that I put into place back in the, in the late 80s, which was when there was no availability of drugs at all for HIV and when we were testing drugs, within a protocol that we would make it available outside of the protocol in what has ultimately turned out to be compassionate use. So what we did is we didn't want to interfere with the integrity of the protocol to determine in a controlled way what was safe and what was effective, but there was a dire need for some sort of accessibility to those drugs outside of a clinical trial for those who might even have some chance of having it. And in fact, that was really in many respects the birth of the really firm concept of uh, compassionate use. And in fact, there is a version of that which I'll hand over to Commissioner Hahn that is, you know, when you have expanded access and emergency use authorizations for drugs that have not yet been fully proven in a clinical trial. So there is somewhat of an analogy and similarity between what I did in the 1980s and what is actually being done by the FDA now. So Steve, if you might wanna comment on that. I think that's right, uh, Dr. Fauci. Um, the emergency use authorization process uh, by statute allows us to have flexibility and uh, assess the risk benefit ratio in a public health emergency. And we've done that on the therapeutic side in three separate occasions and continue to look at those requests as they come in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Braun. Um, Senator Rosen. Here I am. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for uh, uh, bringing this hearing. And I want to thank the dedicated doctors today for their uh, lifetime of work and study and passion. We are a grateful nation uh, for all of your, your lifelong commitment uh, in fighting disease, uh, not just in the United States, but around the world. And, you know, as I talk to Nevadans about safely reopening the economy, one question that frequently comes up is, uh, when are we going to have a vaccine like everyone's talked about? And Nevada, travel and tourism, of course, the lifeblood for us. And the jobs associated with those industries can only fully come back if we know it's safe to travel and visit uh, our, our work at our hotels, uh, casinos, restaurants, and attractions. Ultimately, to make this happen, we have to build confidence in our visitors that it's safe, we need a vaccine, and that research is extremely important. However, understanding that this takes time to develop and ensure, and ensure both safety and efficacy, I'd like to hear more about what research is happening regarding preventative medication research that could be helpful in the time frame before a vaccine, uh, and especially before one is widely available. So I'd like to ask if this could be part of the path helping us begin to reopen our economy safely and uh, bring visitors not only back to Nevada, but across our country. So Dr. Fauci, what research is currently happening to identify potential monoclonal antibody preventative treatments or other therapeutics? If the right antibody is identified or can be identified, 
Could this be used as a preventative medication to block COVID-19 virus from latching onto those host cells, much like the treatments for rheumatoid arthritis, severe asthma, or other diseases? And secondly, would preventative medication options like this help complement uh, the effectiveness of, vac of a vaccine once it's available? Yeah, so thank you for that question, uh, Senator Rosen. That's an excellent question. And in all of the therapeutic interventions, that we are developing, and you mentioned several of them. They could be direct antivirals along the line of remdesivir, but that's just an, one of a number of possibilities since there are several viral targets in the replication cycle. Using convalescent plasma in a preventive modality, as well as monoclonal antibodies in a preventive modality are in fact all feasible and will be pursued in parallel with the development of a vaccine. The model of using drugs and other interventions that are effective for treatment is really a great success story in the issue with HIV AIDS, because many of the interventions that were developed for the full treatment of an infected person are exquisitely effective in preventing infection of HIV. So that's the kind of model that we work out in parallel with treatment for disease, it's the using as treatment as prevention. I believe that will be a part of our effort at the same time as we're putting a full court press on trying to get a vaccine. So it's an excellent question, very relevant. I know I have a short time left, so I'm just gonna kind of abbreviate this. The second most uh, important question that I get, not just from our first responders and people worried about work, but generally, what does the next generation of PPE need to look like for all of us as we go about our lives, not just as workers, it, but depending on your work, you may need something stronger, more specific, but as all of us, as we wanna go out and shop or out to eat or whatever those things are, get on an airplane, um, should masks be made of a certain material, uh, gloves, are handkerchiefs effective? Um, can you talk about PPE for the general public? Well, you know, the best PPE for the general public, if possible, right now, is to maintain the physical and social distancing. But as we've said, and I think all of us would agree, there are certain circumstances in which it is beyond your control when you need to do necessary things, like go to the drugstore and get your medication, go to the grocery store and get your food, mm -hmm. that in fact you need some supplementation to just physical distancing. And that's the reason why some time ago, the recommendation was made, I believe it was Dr. Redfield at the CDC who first said that, about getting some sort of a covering. We, we don't want to call it a mask because back then we were concerned we would be taking masks away from the healthcare providers. But some sort of mask-like facial covering, I think for the time being, should be a very regular part of how we prevent the spread of infection. And in fact, the more and more as you go outside, right here and where I'm sitting in Washington, D.C., you can see many people out there with masks on which gives me some degree of comfort that people are taking this very seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rosen. Um, Senator Leffler. <clears throat> Thank you all for being here and for your service. Uh, Admiral Jirwa, before I start my questions, I want to recognize your new role as the U.S. representative to the World Health Organization. Mitigating a resurgence of this pandemic will take global cooperation. In order to do that, we need accountability and transparency at the WHO. This organization was established to ensure the timely flow of accurate, unbiased information on global health emergencies just as this. Reforms, reforms must be made in order to restore the trust that we need here. I hope you'll work with our allies to push for these reforms. This question, uh, I have two questions. The first one is for Dr. Redfield. Uh, and, and Dr. Redfield, Georgians are wondering how we got here today. 1,400 deaths, a third of Georgia's workforce out of work. I'm incredibly concerned about the cover-up and the misinformation coming from China and their efforts to suppress life-saving information at the outset of uh, this outbreak. As we, as we continue to reopen our economy safely, we have to take steps to ensure that another outbreak cannot take hold of the world in this way. 
I understand CDC has worked with the Chinese CDC on global health security for decades. Can you comment on the level and the timing of the information that you received and relied upon from your Chinese counterparts as this virus emerged? Well, thank you very much, Senator, and I, I want to echo how important global health security is as a uh, uh, national security priority for this nation. And we're going to need to be able to be able to respond to that as long as we are a nation. CDC has had uh, relationships uh, with many countries around the world. We have offices uh, in over 45 countries right now, people in over 60. And one of those happens to be China, where we have a U.S. CDC that's with the Chinese CDC. We've worked together for, for decades, particularly on influenza and emerging infectious diseases. Um, and that has been a very productive, uh, collaborative, scientific to scientific interaction. Uh, when this uh, original outbreak of pneumonia of unknown etiology came from the original um, seafood market, there were obviously discussions with the U.S. personnel that were engaging with the Chinese CDC. I personally had discussions as early, I think CDC did as early as January and myself January 3rd with my counterpart to discuss this. So at a scientific level, we had very good interaction. I think, you know, that's different than the, the broader uh, Chinese government level. Thank you, Dr. Redfield. I have a final question for each of our, our great witnesses today, and it's one that uh, my constituents often ask me. Uh, the mainstream media, and indeed some of my colleagues in the Senate, seem to want to paint each of your relationships with our president during this wartime effort as confrontational and lacking consensus. Can you categorically say here to the American people today whether this is true or untrue? From your testimony today, I've seen a very coordinated effort to address this with the administration to combat this pandemic. Can you give me a sense of whether this what the characterization uh, is is, whether it's true or untrue. Thank you. I'd ask Dr. Fauci to answer that first. Yes, no, there is certainly not a confrontational relationship between me and the president. Uh, as I've mentioned many times, I give uh, advice and opinion based on evidence-based scientific information. Uh, he hears that, uh, he respects it, he gets opinions from a variety of other people, but in no way in my experience over the last several months, has there been any confrontational relationship between us? Thank you, Dr. Redfield, Dr. Hahn. Again, I would echo what uh, Dr. Fauci said, and we're there to give our best public health device, um, and that's what we do, it's grounded in data and science. Um, and uh, I've always felt free to give the best public health uh, advice that I think uh, needs to be given at the time, and it's always been done in a very professional way. Senator Luffler, this is Steve Hahn. Um, uh, I do not have a confrontational relationship, have not had a confrontational relationship with the president. He asks questions. Um, I have given him my honest answers rooted in data and science, um, and he has listened respectfully uh, to those uh, incorporating that into his decision making. And Brett Joie, I have nothing else but to, to echo uh, my colleagues. We work very closely together, um, all the scientists, all the physicians, um, of course, Ambassador Burke, uh, other scientists within our group. Um, we have a very productive working relationship with each other and also uh, with the president and vice president. It would not be confrontational, and I certainly feel that we have the ability to honestly state uh, our opinions and recommendations uh, and that's been uh, that way since the beginning. Thank you, Senator Leffler. You. Uh, Senator Murray, do you have closing comments? I, I do, and if it's all right, I have a couple, two quick questions. Sure. Well, thank you. Um, you know, Dr. Fauci, while President Trump claimed otherwise, there is no question that an essential part of reopening our economy safely is successfully developing and distributing a vaccine for COVID-19. We need to plan now to deploy a vaccine once it's proven safe and effective, but it is absolutely crucial this planning process from the clinical trial to distribution and administration 
recognizes and addresses racial and ethnic disparities in our healthcare system that, as we all know, for too long have been overlooked and unacknowledged in this country. And we have to ensure equitable access, access to this vaccine for everyone. Dr. Fauci, let me start with you. What steps is NIH taking to make sure that clinical trials for COVID-19 vac vaccines and therapeutics account for racial and ethnic disparities? Yeah, thank you very much. That's a very relevant question, Senator Murray. And in fact, in the design of our clinical trials and the sites that we've chosen in our clinical trial network, it's gonna be very representative of being able to get minority populations and, patient, and, and populations at most risk to be part of the trial so that we know during the trial what the relative efficacy as well as potential for adverse events. It's something we started back in the days of HIV when we tried to get good demographic representation and we're gonna do that with these trials. Thank you. Th thank you. And Dr. Hahn, tell me what steps FDA is taking now to make sure the United States is prepared to produce a sufficient number of vaccines, including the necessary manufacturing, supply chain capacity for supplies like vials and stoppers and syringes. Thank you, Senator. Um, this uh, is an effort that started uh, as a partnership with uh, the vaccine developers and the NIH um, and their efforts. So one of the most important things, ma'am, has been the uh, data transparency, uh, sharing of data uh, both with the uh, agency, NIH, and with the manufacturers, so we can understand what the capacities are, what the needs are from the supply chain, um, and then how to actually share that so that if one manufacturer's vaccine doesn't go forward, we can use the capacity of, of that manufacturer for another manufacturer's vaccine. I'm very happy to report that uh, the work of Dr. Marx and Dr. Fauci's group has led to that sort of effort. We are, we've developed, as I mentioned before, this Gantt chart that describes all the steps that go forward with vaccination, including those supplies you described. It is somewhat complicated, ma'am, in that we may very well have hopefully five to seven different candidate vaccines that may need different supplies associated with them. But we've been upfront identifying those supplies, where they're available, and then working with the manufacturers to make sure that they are available. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Chairman, thank you, and thank you to all of our witnesses for joining us today. It is really clear to me that we have more work to do before we can safely get back to work and school and some semblance of normal life in our country. We still need testing to be fast, free, and everywhere, and we need the White House to lay out a detailed national plan to make that happen. We still need adequate personal protective equipment, both for our healthcare workers and for workers at our businesses and at schools when the time comes. We still need guidance from our experts so our communities have the information that they need to reopen schools and businesses safely, confidentially, confidently, and complete competently. And so public health workers and healthcare providers have the information they need to keep their patients and communities safe. And while experts have been clear that the day we can safely reopen may be a ways off, there's plenty for us to do in the meantime, both to plan ahead, for example, to make sure that once we have a safe and effective vaccine, we can produce and distribute it to everyone quickly, equitably, and at no cost, and to address the immediate challenges, for example, making sure there are appropriate mental health resources for everyone who's coping with the challenges that are prevented, presented by this virus, from the stress of physical isolation, loss of income, to the trauma and anxiety of patients and workers who've been on the front lines. So I'm gonna keep pressing Congress and the White House to provide the action and leadership that our communities need. And I hope, Mr. Chairman, that we'll continue to have the opportunities like this to hear directly from the experts and ask pressing questions about how to get our country through this crisis. It's clear we've got a lot further to go, a lot more to do. And so I hope that as our efforts continue, we'll be able to bring many of you back, uh, our witnesses, for another hearing soon. And again, thank you to all of you for joining us today. Thank you, Senator Murray. Um, I, I've got a clarification question and a couple of quick comments, and then we'll, we'll thank the witnesses and wind up a hearing. My clarification is I want to make sure I didn't create some confusion by the way I asked the question about going back to school. I asked 
Dr. Fauci first about treatments and vaccines and Dr. Admiral Giroir second about testing. What I thought I heard was that Dr. Fauci said that vaccines are coming as fast as they ever have, but it'll it'll be later in the year, at, least, at the earliest before we see that, that there's some treatments of, of that, that have, uh, that are modest, but are promising, there could be more, but that that doesn't mean you shouldn't go back to school. Uh, that, that, that would be more for a testing strategy. Am, am I right, Dr. Fauci? You didn't, you didn't say you shouldn't go back to school because we won't have vaccines no, by the fall. No, absolutely not, uh, Mr. Chairman. What I, what I was referring to is that going back to school would be more in the realm of knowing the landscape of infection with regard to testing. And as Admiral Jouar said, it would depend on the dynamics of the outbreak in the region where the school is. But I did not mean to imply at all any relationship between the availability of a vaccine and treatment and our ability to go back to school. You're quite correct. Thank you. And what I heard from Admiral Giroir was that um, you're ramping up current technologies. You are um, uh, hopeful for Dr. Carlin, Dr. Collins' shark tank in the National Institutes of Health. But in any event, you, you would expect to have the capacity uh, in the fall of 40 to 50 million tests a month. And that ought to be adequate for the principal of a middle school or even the chancellor of a campus uh, to divine, de design a testing strategy that could provide, for example, a, an antigen quick test to screen all the students in the school if necessary. Is that correct? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. And, and again, we want to make as many tests available as as absolutely possible. What I what I said is what I feel comfortable with, knowing uh, the production schedules, uh, being in the position of being able to work with uh, the FDA and CDC, that we should have 40 to 50, we will have 40 to 50 million uh, tests available per month that need to be deployed in a smart, strategic way, depending on the dynamics you know, in that area and in that region. Um, still, having testing even widely does not nullify the need that we're going to have to change our practices in terms of sanitation, uh, personal cleanliness, uh, distancing, face masks, things like that, uh, given uh, what the dynamics could be. Give, 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 well, thank you for those comments, because given the given that number of tests that will be available in, say, three months, or as we ramp up to that number three months from now, that should give every principal, every every uh, every chancellor of every college campus. And again, we have about 5,000 campuses and 100,000 schools, a, a some reassurance that testing, as well as the common sense hygiene practices you talked about could be used to develop a strategy for reopening school for school in August. And then two quick comments. One is uh, Senator Murray talked about the national plan, which was in the legislation that we all voted for. There's a little bit of a push and tug between what's national and what's federal, what Washington should do and what the state should do. I've always thought it's a mistake to say federal equals national. In other words, COVID-19 is clearly a national problem, but that doesn't mean the federal government's supposed to do everything. For example, in testing, um, the law actually requires states to tell you, Admiral Giroir, uh, what their plans are, what their needs are. And then you said that during the month of May, you had a series of state plans that identified 12 and a half million uh, tests, and you thought you could help meet that. On the other hand, you've also noticed a deficiency in the marketplace for some supplies, so the federal government is buying those and allocating them to the state. So we don't want to get in a situation where Admiral Giroir is telling all the states what to do. Governor Lee in Tennessee doesn't really want you to tell him what to do. Uh, he wants to tell you <laughs> what he's doing and let you comment on it. I don't think Governor Cuomo wants President Trump telling him what to do. So a, a, a the push and tug between what Washington does and what the states do, I think we have a testing, uh, contact tracing, isolating national strategy and plan led by the governors, uh, designed by the federal government as a national effort. And then the national effort clearly 
is to do the research for the treatments and the vaccines. And what we've heard today is that's coming along on a faster track than we've ever seen, ever seen before. Um, finally, I want to reiterate, I, I thought this was a very helpful hearing. I thank the senators for their questions. I think anybody who took the time to watch would be impressed by the diversity of opinion and the honest answers we got from four really remarkable experts who are in the midst of this every day. I want to reemphasize what I said earlier that I intend to make sure that we focus. Senator Murray suggested we need to have more hearings. I agree with her. And as we deal with this pandemic, we need to make sure we're ready for the next one. Uh, what can we learn about faster treatments and vaccines for the next one? What can we learn about uh, the stockpile? What ought to be in it? Who ought to be manage it for the next one? Uh, what can we learn? Can we learn anything about having hospital beds so we don't have to shut down hospitals and bankrupt them and push patients out uh, in order to create beds for sick people from the pandemic? Uh, what about states and hospitals that sell off their PPE in between pandemics? How do we keep our focus in between pandemics when we have so many important things to be worried about in this country? How do we make sure that we in Congress sustain and fund all the things that we need to do? So, and, and I wanna make sure that we do that this year. I mean, we, our collective memory is short. So while we're all worried about this, we need to not only deal with this crisis, but get ready for the next one. I thank the witnesses for their extra time. I hope they get a sense that our job we see is to create an environment in which you can succeed because if you succeed, our country succeeds, which is what we desperately want. Um, the hearing record will remain open for 10 days. Members may submit additional information for the record within that time if they would like. Thanks to everyone for being here today. The hearing is adjourned. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Murray. Appreciate it. Dr. Anthony Fauci warned today that opening the country too quickly could lead to serious consequences, but he held out hope that a vaccine could be developed. This is live coverage from the Washington Post. That concludes today's hearing. I'm Libby Casey. This was the first time Dr. Fauci and the nation's other top medical officials testified before Congress since President Trump declared a national emergency back in March. Well, joining me now to recap what happened today is my colleague, James Homan, national political reporter. Uh, James will be with us in just a moment. He's been monitoring and listening to the hearing from home as I've been reporting from the Washington Post newsroom. James, uh, you know, it was so interesting to hear senators from both sides of the aisle press the witnesses to increase testing and contact tracing. Did we hear a clear path forward on those fronts? Well, Libby, we did hear a reality check. I think that was the big takeaway related to testing. You know, it was night and day between what we saw at the White House in the Rose Garden where Trump declared victory on testing. And then you had his own top health officials saying, no, we're actually, we have a lot more work to do, but we actually are ramping up uh, quite a lot. We should have enough testing to be able to do a lot of what we're not doing by the fall. Uh, we heard Senator Alexander, the chairman of the committee at the end, say there should be testing for schools and colleges uh, by the fall. We heard uh, Anthony Fauci say a few hours ago uh, to Maggie Hassan from New Hampshire and Bob Casey from Pennsylvania that nursing homes need a lot more testing, uh, that nursing home, uh, that the, the kind of the nurses and people who are going in and out of nursing homes need to be regularly tested, the staff there, and that they're working on ramping that up. So clearly there is some theory of the case, uh, but we didn't get a lot of detailed timelines. And then we saw both sides really jump on the South Korea example. Uh, that has been something that people have hammered the White House for, which is originally the first reported cases in, came the same day in South Korea and the United States. South Korea ramped up testing very quickly. Uh, Democrats have said, the Trump administration should have done the same. Yesterday in the Rose Garden, uh, Trump touted the absolute number of tests that the U.S. has conducted compared to South Korea, including per capita. But what they omitted was that kind of when those tests actually happened and the fact that South Korea was able to do them early. So today you heard South Korea come up a lot from Republicans and Democrats. Mitt Romney sort of playing something of a role of foil to the administration, kind of getting the administration witnesses to acknowledge that, uh, that the U.S. The testing is nothing to be proud of, as he said, uh, that it has not been an American success story and drawing the comparisons. Tim Kaine had a slide 
comparing South Korea and the US by various metrics. So again, it, it's a hot potato, but I think everyone at this hearing agreed, including the administration witnesses, that testing ha has not been kind of fully the success that the president would, would have us believe from the Rose Garden. Mm. You know, that slide that uh, Senator Kane showed had the numbers in stark comparison, the U.S. with over 81,000 confirmed deaths, South Korea with just 256 confirmed deaths. And also, since this hearing was about reopening the economy, it also pointed out the economic differences, more than a 14 percent unemployment rate here in the U.S. and just a 4 percent unemployment rate in South Korea. Let's go to my colleague Rhonda Colvin, who's on Capitol Hill. Rhonda, what were your main takeaways from today's hearing? Well, overall, I think it's the uh, four witnesses wanted to bring home the fact that we are not out of the woods. That's what Dr. Redfield said. That's what Dr. Fauci said, that we still need to take this very seriously. Uh, one of the uh, exchanges that stood out to me was when Senator Rand Paul discussed uh, children going back to school. He said we need to look at uh, the models overseas and see that sc schools that did not shut down, uh, there weren't a lot of cases. So the, uh, the American students need to return to school before they're too far behind. And he said that Dr. Fauci shouldn't be the end all, end all on this. Now, I think what's important is Dr. Fauci's response to that. It illustrates how he has usually approached questions like that. He said he doesn't believe he's the end all, but he also doesn't know everything. And he's usually very candid when he says he doesn't know everything. And we don't yet know how this is going to affect children. So uh, he's very quick to say when he doesn't know everything. And I think he uh, did that a few times today. Uh, in this hearing, it wasn't moment. as contentious. Just you know, as Rhonda, just one yes. moment. I, w I want to just pick up on that, and I want to hear more about sort of the tone and the tenor of this. But that exchange was so interesting with Rand Paul because we heard Dr. Fauci uh, mention this concern over this mysterious syndrome, the, the, these reactions that some children are having, and they're trying to track and figure out just what that is. And so Dr. Fauci um, said we can't be cavalier in thinking that children are completely immune to the effects of this disease, pushing back against what Rand Paul said. Um, and, and please continue about uh, sort of the, the tone of this hearing. Right, yeah, he wanted to make sure that we just didn't dismiss it and say, you know, children don't have as high as a mortality rate as older individuals. That's something that was said very, very early on back in early March, late February, that this disease was really uh, impacting older uh, generations and that kids or younger people who are healthy would be just fine. And that has not exactly been the case uh, since we've seen this coronavirus play out. So that was something that Dr. Fauci really wanted to be clear, that we don't really know all the facts just yet. Things are still developing. Uh, what I was mentioning about the tone of the hearing, it wasn't as contentious as some hearings we might have seen. Um, Lamar Alexander did mention at the top of his remarks that we should, uh, the senators should approach this in a bipartisan fashion um, and, and put any finger pointing aside. You didn't see much of that. Of course, there are always going to be politics. And you did have uh, Senator Warren. She used up some of her time to point out uh, and criticize that the president did not handle this right in the beginning, and that's why we are where we are today with the number of deaths. And uh, Bernie Sanders said that as well, too, about that early response. Uh, Senator Kane, as I believe James mentioned, too, he uh, talked about uh, South Korea having surpassed us in the way that they handled this, and why is that? So there were a little bit of, uh, you know, some politics there in this hearing. Kelly Loeffler at the end, she's in a, a, a tough race right now in Georgia. She's supportive of the president and asked the men, uh, do they have a confrontational a relationship with the president. So yes, a little bit of politics were sprinkled in today, uh, but overall it wasn't as contentious. You are sensing a little bit of a bipartisan spirit in how do we ramp up testing? How do we move forward? And also I'd like to note with the logistics of this hearing, there weren't a lot of technical glitches. Um, there weren't a, a lot of issues with mute buttons or anything like that. Uh, so you almost have to wonder, is this what we're going to see from now on? Uh, because of congressional rules state that you can't have markups or vote in committee committee hearings remotely. Um, they can't have full-scale committees in a, a virtual setting, but perhaps like we saw today where it was a partial virtual setting, we may see uh, more high-profile hearings to come in the House and the Senate uh, that utilize technology like this. Libby? 
Thanks, Rhonda. James, we heard Senator Chris Murphy, a Democrat of Connecticut, really implore the director of the CDC to give more guidance and more details about just how to proceed and move forward, trying to pin him down on when they would get follow-up advice, right? Not just these sort of, you know, hallmark guidelines, but, but more specifics about if this happens, this is the course that you take. And he ended by saying soon isn't terribly helpful because he couldn't get an answer from Dr. Redfield about just when more guidance would come. Uh, what are the complications here for Dr. Redfield? The complications are significant. The, Dr. Redfield has been squeezed sort of inside the White House Coronavirus Task Force. There was a meeting uh, a week ago, Wednesday, so a week ago tomorrow, uh, where Deborah Burks, the uh, doctor who leads the task force, basically upbraided him in front of everyone in the room, according to our reporting, and complained about lots of problems in the CDC and their delays and their lack of reliable data. And so he has sort of in many ways been sidelined. The CDC hasn't had its own standalone briefing in some time. Uh, and so the challenge for him is that he you know, wants to make sure that he continues to have a seat at the table and he needs to, you know, the, 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 a, a, I think a lot of people in the administration have sort of scapegoated the CDC in some ways. I think one of the things the hearing highlighted was some of the deeper problems in our public health infrastructure that we sort of took for granted. Uh, we sort of assumed that the CDC was the world's premier gold standard organization at, at this kind of thing. And we've seen kind of that there's been some atrophy over time with budget cuts and various other things. And so he, he in some ways, is trying to preserve the reputation of his agency. Um, let's go back to Rhonda Colvin on Capitol Hill. Rhonda, you know, we saw at first senators come in wearing masks. They took them off as the hearing went on, but there were other senators who just didn't didn't go for the masks at all, like Senator Rand Paul, who's been a subject of a lot of attention because he's had coronavirus, and there were concerns about whether or not he could spread it to his colleagues just a few weeks ago. Um, Rand Paul seemed to be very critical of this question of whether people could, you know, get the virus again, saying that, you know, we shouldn't talk about how there's not evidence that you have immunity. We should talk about how there's not evidence that you don't have immunity, basically. I'd like to get your thoughts on wearing of the masks, how everyone was distanced and why, and, uh, and, and whether you got the sense of whether the senators were, were sort of wrestling with how to handle themselves in this moment. Yeah, I think senators are still trying to figure that out as well as, you know, the entire Hill. I can tell you this morning, uh, since we've been here, I have seen most senators who have come here to do uh, remote hits with uh, some of the networks. They're wearing masks. They're wearing masks during the interview. They're wearing masks as they walk up and, and talk to uh, the cameramen. So uh, there are a lot of people and gloves, too. I've seen uh, a lot of people wearing gloves as well. Um, you know, there, there does appear to be some divide in thinking when it comes to mask and protect uh, gear here on the Hill. You'll remember back in the last, uh, a few weeks ago, when the House came back to vote on the last uh, aid bill, uh, when people gave speeches, some were wearing masks, others weren't. And I remember talking to uh, Representative Shalala of, Flor of Florida. She said she was stunned that all of her colleagues did not wear masks, and, and she said it appeared more Democrats were wearing them than Republicans. So it, it is sort of uh, interesting and thought-provoking to see how members are approaching uh, the safety themselves. Thanks, Rhonda. James Anthony Fauci warned against states opening prematurely and said there's a real risk that you will trigger an outbreak that you may not be able to control uh, that could lead, as he said, to some suffering and death that could be avoided. Um, James, did you get that message? Uh, did the senators get that message? They did. And I think he, you know, Rand Paul didn't get that message. Rand Paul uh, was being quite cavalier. Uh, you know, in, in saying this is probably a, the primarily a Northeast problem. I think that that uh, he conveyed Fauci very, Dr. Fauci very explicitly made the economic argument, which is that, look, if we open too soon, it's going to end up hurting the economy more in the long term. And I, mean, I think that that kind of the he, Dr. Fauci has been at senior levels in the, the government since the mid 1980s. And he knows the, he understands sort of how this is going to play. He knew that was the soundbite. At one point he was sort of teed up to make that point again, I think a little crisper uh, for, for the cameras. But the whole day, I think his theme was a reality check. Like I said, it, he, and, and one of the areas that was most interesting sort of with the reality check from Dr. Fauci was on the vaccine. Uh, he did, you know, he, he, he had a very nuanced message. He said he is hopeful 
uh, that there are promising signs that a vaccine can be developed for the novel coronavirus. We've never developed a vaccine for a coronavirus before like this. Uh, so, but he said, there's also a risk. There's a chance that the first vaccines we develop, and this is the reason why the experimental phase is so important, is that they could actually have very adverse consequences that in some people, if the vaccine isn't tested sufficiently, it could actually make the coronavirus much worse and even deadlier. And so he's kind of, you know, was saying it's a, his term was a bridge too far to expect that a vaccine is going to be in place for this fall. Uh, you know, I think he thinks the beginning of next year is is maybe overly ambitious. We've obviously done a lot of reporting on the vaccine. This is what so many people care about. Uh, it matters hugely consequentially. And I do think he got across to the senators like, this is not coming around the corner. You need to get used to this new normal. You know, at one point we, when, when Lamar Alexander was asking about the University of Tennessee reopening and testing, uh, the admiral said that there's a, they're looking at ways to be able to test the water coming out of the, the sewage pipes of one of the dorms to see if there's coronavirus in the pipes. And I think that that was sort of an illustration of how things are not going to go back to normal anytime soon, that this is kind of the thing that they're thinking about for the fall. And so that's, so I do think that they're, the reality check as intended was delivered both to the senators in the room and to the American people watching. Let's talk more about a vaccine. You know, when Dr. Fauci was pressed, uh, he was pressed a couple times on this question, he said, it's definitely not a long shot. And, you know, it, it was somewhat reassuring, but also uh, a little frightening because what you want to hear, of course, is it's going to happen in a timeline by which it will happen. He gave some explanation of why he believes it's not a long shot, that because there are cases of people able to recover of the body, as he put it, spontaneously clearing the virus, he does believe they can work towards figuring out how to give someone essentially immunity from coronavirus and then lead eventually to herd immunity. Um, but, but James, you know, if, if you were someone asking questions about a vaccine, did you walk away from this hearing sort of more reassured or with more concern about just how long it could take to develop a vaccine? I think what we all crave, Libby, is honesty. And I think he gave a nuanced answer that conveyed authenticity. And, you know, we're so used to when we watch the, the White House briefings, they're kind of so over the top and so plainly at odds with kind of the facts on the ground that they don't have a lot of credibility. And I think Dr. Fauci has a great deal of credibility. And I think, you know, we, we've no reason to doubt what he's saying there. And it matches with our reporting of talking to companies and other epidemiologists outside the government, which is that, you know, it, we've never developed a vaccine quite like this. There's more than 120 different projects underway to try to develop a vaccine. There are lots of different paths that they're trying to take. Uh, some are certainly going to fail, uh, and but some are, are promising, but they'll take a while to go through all the different phases. And then one of the other points that Dr. Fauci made during the hearing was that then you have to start thinking about the delivery mechanism for these vaccines. You know, that it's not just, even if you come up with an inoculation that works, you've got to figure out how to make enough doses to be able to create, as you described it, herd immunity. Mm -hmm. And to be able to get those doses to you know the developing world that may not be able to afford them and the like and so i think it, it's refreshing to hear someone be realistic about the possibilities and i do think he's you know he's being hopeful and optimistic but also realistic about the challenges um, let's go back to Rhonda on this question of vaccines we also heard senator bernie sanders try to pe press members of the administration to commit to free vaccines, uh, Rhonda, and they sort of kicked the can back to him. Right. Yeah, that was uh, what he spent a lot of his questioning uh, time about is vaccines, Bernie Sanders, and asking, will all people, uh, despite income or, or where they are geographically, will they be able to get this vaccine? And I'm not sure he got the answer that he did. He wanted, but uh, the experts did say that they would try to advocate for this vaccine to get to everyone. So I'm not sure if that's uh, reassuring to anyone. But Dr. Fauci did say that they haven't worked as fast. Uh, in his knowledge, as fast on a vaccine 
um, compared to other times. So uh, it does appear that, you know, there's more progress than the last time uh, these witnesses were on the Hill, but it's still very much a question. And you've even had uh, senators uh, start putting out legislation. I believe it was uh, last week Senator, uh, Senator uh, Elizabeth Warren uh, has put out legislation that people who are in hard hit areas should be getting these uh, COVID-19 therapies first and should be at the top of the list instead of at the bottom. So I would expect this is going to be an issue, vaccines, therapies, an issue ongoing. All right, Rhonda Colvin, thank you so much. James, finally, this question of contact tracing and technology came up. We actually saw a Republican ask about that. Um, what sense do we have of the administration's support of sort of a private-public partnership to do more of a contact tracing effort using technology to even track or surveil people? Well, Libby, this is one of the key points, and, and the chairman, Lamar Alexander, emphasized it. Uh, a lot of state governments are starting to invest in contact tracing. DC Mayor Muriel Bowser announced yesterday that they've hired the first 17 contact tracers of what I think they wanna hire 700 of them. Uh, the, the CDC plan that has not been released uh, publicly, you know, is, it, but that has kind of been circulating around the White House to what we talked about a couple minutes ago, says that they need to make massive investment in contact tracing, but even the numbers that are in the CDC report are still less than what a lot of experts think is realistic. And that's why the tech companies that are normally competitors, uh, Apple and Samsung and Google, uh, are working together uh, to try and develop an app that we can install on our phones. Australia has something like this. A bunch of countries have now rolled out the app. And it's basically a South Korea contact tracing app so that if you, know, you test positive for the coronavirus, you can identify that. And then it tells anyone who was close, you know, less than five feet from you for more than 10 minutes, it tells them uh, that they were in contact, in close contact with someone who was in that position. So the tech companies are trying to develop that app for civil liberties reasons. Our government has made kind of a strategic decision to have the tech companies do that, uh, not the government do that the way that is happening in Australia, uh, but it still hasn't been delivered. And for it to work, you'll need, you know, tens and tens of millions of Americans to download this app and kind of while their, their name might be anonymous, it, that you do give up some degree of, of privacy as part of that. But that is going to be kind of a, a key element of contact tracing in a country of 330 million people. Mm. Well, James, thank you so much. It's so good to see you. I uh, really appreciate your time. James Homan, author of The Daily 202, National Political Reporter. I'd also like to thank Rhonda Colvin for joining us today. And thank you for watching our coverage from The Washington Post, this historic hearing of a topic that affects so many of us, in fact, all of us. We'll continue our COVID-19 coverage this afternoon at three o'clock Eastern time in just about an hour. We'll be back with a special report from the Washington Post. I'll be joined by health policy reporter Yasmin Abu Talib, as well as reporters covering the economy, the latest medical developments and the politics of this story. Please take a moment to subscribe to the Washington Post wherever you may be watching us. Your support helps us deliver the very best in journalism. Thanks again for tuning in. I'm Libby Casey. I will see you right back here shortly at 3 o'clock Eastern.